Just look at the time. Peter and his mom will be here soon to fetch Tiki for the soccer game. But Tiki, talk, what time do you? Good morning, Miss Oh, good morning, morning, girls. Oh, what is Tiki? Yummy. I don't know. No, he Oh, dear. Tiki. Oh, I hope he's awake. Yeah. Uh, Tiki. Hello. Peter and Noah. What are you doing? Tiki. Come on, girls. Eat up. Jump, 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 jump. Yes? You forgot. Forgot what? To wake Tiki up early like you said you would. I did. Well, he's not here, is he? Uh, the masses. Of course, we will be bringing you more tweets as the morning progresses. Do send them at SABC Newsroom. For now, though, let's have a look at your Monday morning headlines. Well, the ANC turns 106 years old today. ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa is expected to deliver the annual January 8th statement in the Eastern Cape this coming Saturday. Several universities finally agreed to admit walk-ins after engaging with the EFF Students Organization at the weekend. The identification process of the bodies of victims of a train crash between Kronstadt and Henenman is expected to resume today. Let's have a look at your sporting headlines. The Proteus will resume play at the crease later this morning after rain prevented play on day three of the first cricket test between the Proteus and India at Newlands in Cape Town. Another day in Celtic moved two places on the log to six after a 2-1 win against Golden Arrows. Let's have a look at your top story this morning. While the ANC turns 106 years old today, ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa will deliver the annual January 8th statement in the Eastern Cape on Saturday. The tradition dates back to 1972 when then-President Oatambo delivered the first January 8th statement to celebrate the ANC's 60th anniversary. Otambo used the occasion to get freedom fighters to intensify the armed struggle. The newly elected ANC President is expected to use his inaugural speech to call for unity. This year, it is a very different January 8th statement. I mean, I remember very well that some years in the past we used to say it is very different, but it was on a gradualist approach. But now the problem is that the ANC that went into uh, the elective conference in December a few years ago, it came out a very different ANC. They have taken radical policy positions that uh, I think the nation and even the international community will need a voice as to what do they mean in terms of the programs of the year? What do they mean? those policy positions that they've taken with regard to expropriation of land without compensation, free education, what will they translate into when it comes to programs of the year? That is, I think, the level of anxiety that this year's speech comes against. Meanwhile, the newly elected president of the African National Congress, Sir Ramaphosa, will deliver his first January 8th statement in East London on the 13th of January. The January 8th statement is traditionally used by the ANC to convey the party's message to its members. 
The first January 8th statement by the party's leader, Oliver Tambo, this at a time when most of the ANC leadership and members were either in prison, in hiding, or scattered all over the world. The ANC January 8th statement assumed great significance during the difficult years of exile. At all times, the theme of the January 8th statement is informed by an appraisal of the internal and external challenges the organization faces. Such an analysis enables the NC to identify and minimize both the weakness and the threats it faces. At the same time, it enables the NC to exploit the opportunities that are available as it builds itself into a robust machinery. There has been a great deal of coherence from within the ANC. So when the time came, the January 8th statement, people expected the ANC to just emphasize some of the priorities that uh, the party is already pursuing in government. So the speech was usually used to recapture the national mood, to say to the people that uh, these are priority areas that we are going to actually emphasize. In most of the times, we have never seen a groundbreaking announcement when it comes to policy position of the ANC being delivered through the January 8th because the party is in government they are uh, implementing their mandate in government what they usually did with the January 8th statement was just to amplify a certain point for the year it also served the purpose of ensuring that all NC members read from the same hymn sheet doing so ensure that all members of the NC irrespective of their location carry the same message with the NC reasserting itself as a strategic political center, the January 8th statement now looms large. The statement prefigures what the present state of the nation address would entail. This year, it is a very different January 8th statement. I mean, I remember very well that some years in the past we used to say it is very different, but it was on a gradualist approach. But now the problem is that the NC that went into uh, the elective conference in December a few years ago, it came out a very different ANC. They have taken radical policy positions that uh, I think the nation and even the international community will need a voice as to what do they mean in terms of the programs of the year? What do they mean? those policy positions that they've taken with regard to expropriation of land without compensation, free education, what will they translate into when it comes to programs of the year? That is, I think, the level of anxiety that this year's speech comes against. With an overwhelming 1.2 strong members, the gathering for the January 8th statement has become a sort of annual pilgrimage. At this gathering, the NC converts and their fellow travelers congregate to receive an unmediated message and directives from the NC president. The reality is that the new president of the NC, Mr. Sil Ramaphosa, he has now inherited a party that has taken a very radical stance. But on the other hand, the nation wants to see changes within the ANC. So my view is that he's caught in between. Is he going to be realistic? He's going to have to balance severely than we've seen before. The condition of freedom has introduced behaviors that the NC considers alien to its character and culture. It has packaged these as sins of incumbency. This includes careerism, abuse of power, bureaucratic elitism, use of state institutions to fight intra-party conflicts. Within the party itself, uh, people also want to know where does power lie, uh, what is going on, uh, how are we going to manage the impending exit of the former president of the ANC. So that is why they cannot afford to use this speech as a normal ritual observation of the party. What they need to do is to use it to try to instill confidence in terms of their leadership. We have not had the president of the ANC speaking to the nation since he was elected in December. He gave a speech, but it was meant for the NC, no doubt about it. But now you have the January 8th. We want to hear the party's position, and it has to be delivered through that speech. In a large measure, aside from economic issues, these are some of the issues that the NC will have to find itself preoccupied with. Lehana Tsoteti, SABC News, Johannesburg. Remaining with the ruling party, ANC's Sir Ramaphosa has reiterated his call for the party to unite and dismantle factionalism within its ranks. Ramaphosa says ANC leaders and members must work together to strengthen the party, irrespective of which candidate they supported in the recent elective congress. He was speaking during a courtesy visit to Zulu King Goodwill's Wilatini in Nongoma in northern KZN, accompanied by four members of the top six. 
dubbed the program of unity and renewal of the party. Newly elected ANC President Ramaphosa leading the ANC's top structure to introduce them to King Goodwill Zuelatini. Unity topped the agenda. The ANC was deeply divided ahead of its elective conference, which saw Ramaphosa defeat in Kosazana Dlamini Zuma. Ramaphosa cautioned the party against factionalism and called for unity. The contest that we had is over. The contest that we had over leadership is over. And in fact, the winner of this contest is the African National Congress. Ramaphosa said expropriation of land without compensation must be done in a way that wouldn't hinder the country's economy, agricultural production and stability. As we take land, we do not harm the economy, we do not harm agricultural production, and we do not sacrifice food security. King Goodwill also stressed that there must be unity among the warring factions. He congratulated the party on a successful elective conference, but warned that the newly elected leadership has a mammoth task ahead. This is the uniform that you're taking. Today the whole country looks up to you for this system leadership. Leadership that builds and doesn't destroy. Leadership that builds on the works of all those who have born before you. The king also called on the ANC to ensure that the role of traditional leaders is respected. Ramaphosa presented the Zulu monarch with cattle as a gesture of goodwill. The king returned the favor with an Nguni cowhide shield. The leaders are set to visit the graves of former ANC leaders in the province on Monday. Earlier, SABC News spoke to the party's national spokesperson, Kusela Digo, about the preparation for today's big celebration. She was at the Olange Institute in Inanda on the KZN North Coast. This is an annual celebration. I think we've, over the years, built the capacity to be able to do it. Uh, but it's special because the 54th National Conference would have laid the ground for this that we're doing now in terms of the celebrations. You're seeing an ANC that is much stronger, an ANC that is more united, an ANC that really has focus in terms of the program that we're going to be running this year. So the January 8th statement that you speak about on the 13th of January uh, that the President, Comrade Sir Ramaphosa, will deliver, will really unpack, report back on conference and pack the program for the year, but obviously within the broader outlook of the five-year resolutions that we took at conference. So we're starting here uh, today uh, as part of the celebrations. As you're saying, we're standing on hallowed ground. We've come back to the founding fathers of the African National Congress, you know, to reconnect with our communities, report back on what we did at conference. We're going to be laying wreaths. The president will lay a wreath uh, for uh, former president Langalibale Ledube here. Right here. Right here. The deputy president will be in Moses Mabida. Uh, Comrade Didi Mabuza, he will lay a wreath at the resting place of uh, President Josiah Gumede and then will then converge later on uh, at the resting place of former President uh, Chief Albert Lutut. So really just connecting, going back, uh, you, sorry, and we started with uh, former President Oliver Tambo in Johannesburg. So we're building up, hoping to visit all of our presidents during the course of the year and then go down to East London for the cake cutting ceremony this afternoon. Yeah. So it's going to be a really eventful day, but we've made sure that it's got the necessary content to celebrate 100 in six years of self struggle. The organization needs to have a stance and it's really commendable that everyone is talking about this unity. But there are reports of disunity and especially in this province that we're in, people who are apparently disgruntled uh, at the new leadership and are not convinced um, that this is the leadership to follow. How do we say to our viewers mm. out there, mm. you hear this, but this is what the mm. ANC is saying? Well, the reality of the matter is that you had branches of the ANC representing our almost million members who came to conference and they absolutely rejected disunity, they rejected factionalism. They did not elect a leadership that came from one so-called slate, but they chose a unity leadership. And I think that sends a very strong message to say that as branches of the ANC, as society in general, South Africans do not want to see a divided ANC. And ours is to ensure that that leadership begins to work together as a collective yeah. in order for the the prosperity of the nation.
That was Gusela Diko, the ANC's national spokesperson, talking to SABC News earlier. For more now on the story, we are now joined by our reporter Ayanda Mthongo, who is in Olange in Durban, where members of the top six of the ANC, Gwena Mantashe, the newly elected chairman, among others, will visit the grave of former ANC president Albert Latuli. Very good morning to you, Ayanda. Can you possibly take us and guide us through uh, today's program? <laughs> Yeah, well, a very good morning to you, Shante. Yeah, it's a special day for the ANC, celebrating 106 years today, and uh, the top six of the ANC deciding that um, celebration is also part of remembering and uh, giving thanks and going back to uh, the forefathers of the party, those that, that uh, established um, the African National Congress. And uh, it's important that they go back, that they pay homage to uh, the uh, presidents of the uh, ANC and today this is what the day is about it's about of course a celebration but also a day for the ANC to reflect as uh, it is about to uh, chart the way forward uh, for 2018 as we know that of course uh, the uh, party will be gathered later on, on the, ne the weekend uh, in East London for the January 8 celebrations but uh, they made this very important stop in KwaZulu Natal starting of course uh, yesterday as you know they visited uh, King Gu well as well team you also gave them words of support and encouragement throughout this year and of course because of the challenges that the ANC has had uh, during the course of last year and the build-up to its 54th uh, national conference in saying that uh, he's hopeful that they will come together and they will work for the ANC and they'll work for the government but uh, here we are gathered at Oshlange which is the uh, resting place of the founding president of the ANC Dr. John Langalbalele Duben you can see um, his uh, grave behind us this is where this giant of the liberation movement rests and this is where the uh, president of the ANC, Mr. Cyril uh, Ramaphosa, he'll be coming here to a lay a wreath accompanied by some of the members of the top six. Now, of course, there are three um, uh, uh, presidents that are laid to rest here in Kwasu Natal. There's also uh, Josiah Komede, who lies at Mountain Rise in Peter Maritzburg. And uh, the deputy uh, president is going to be going uh, to uh, there, is going there, accompanied by some of the uh, uh, members of the ANC and leaders of the ANC here in KZN and once they're all done here and in Peter Maritzburg they will then join together all the DA top six officials will then meet in um, Guatuguza at the resting place of Chief Albert Lutuli where they will then all uh, come together but now just to speak about uh, this day and of course the celebrations it's not just the top six that is here ANC NEC uh, member leaders they are also uh, here to be part of today's very very important Event and I'm now joined by ANC NEC member uh, Peggy Glenn. Good morning to you. Uh, compliments to the new year. Same with you and the whole viewership. Compliments of the new year. <laughs> um, um, so today, it's a celebration, 106 years of this giant uh, movement, um, and you've said that it is important that as the ANC, you go back to the beginning, that you pay your respects, you pay homage to the founding fathers of this movement. Well, uh, to start with, I don't know what was in the heads of the starting of the founding fathers, that they did not enjoy Christmas and New Year and they opted to be there on January 8th, which has left all of us not enjoying the holiday to the latter. Our, our holiday ends on the third on the fourth, but it has started very well. I think we're feeling much good. As you say, that the president was here yesterday, went to see Isilo. Today is here to visit the, the sleeping giants of the African National Congress. We are standing on a very holy ground in terms of the ANC here. Uh, John Langalbalele, Dr. Mafuguzela, Onjeng Ezulu. The president will be here soon. Uh, the SG secretary has arrived already. The deputy uh, president is in my respect. Mountain Rise together with the chair. And as you have said, all of us will be here, visit the family of Seme. I think we'll touch base a little bit with the Kandi, uh, with, with the Kandi settlement, go <coughs> and see people there. But we all then we move, Exodus to to Crowdville, where we see another giant of that. It's quite a good, it's quite a good time, makes you feel very good before we move to the Eastern Cape where everybody will be.
You're celebrating 106 years this year, and of course, um, uh, the ANC um, having a bit of a rough patch uh, last year and the build up to last year's uh, conference. Um, now, you were saying that you want to start off this year on a clean slate, you want to move forward, you've elected a new leadership, a leadership that represents unity for the organization. And this is uh, the year where you need to show that as leaders, you have to come together and um, uh, amend the, 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 the bridges. And uh, it, it is always so when we go to election, there will be a bit of a, a, a rough patch, whether it's uh, is, uh, Polo One, whether it's Manga Wong, which was less, I agree with, with Polo One. Even at the branch level, in the, in the regional, and then we go there, we get cleans in the conference, we come up with the leadership, and we, we follow, we, we go forward, and we go back to patch those potholes that would have been there uh, going forward. I, I haven't had anybody, maybe before, but after saying, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa is not my president. I haven't anybody. Even the people in the Congress that you know very well that they were on the other side with the NTZ or with the, with the CRO 17. Look, those are gone now. There is an ANC leadership that has been elected. We all follow there. Yes, those potholes, we need to go back, patch them, and, uh, and, 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 and work towards the unity going forward, especially in this province. What I'm very glad about in this province, we've all agreed that maybe we went a little bit overboard towards, towards a conference, but all we have agreed that we need to come come back, sit together with ourselves, resolve the thing, especially with the impetus that was given by the king yesterday. You, you could see Ben Atmeng was just telling us what to do and I will have no option but the ANC itself has agreed to that unity, 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 moving towards 2019. And just speak about these giants that you're honouring uh, today. You come from the Gosnet, got from Gosnatal, and I'm sure having followed in the footsteps of uh, men like uh, Bab Josiah Kumede, like uh, Chief Albert Lutuli, like Dr. Langal Balele Dube, and, uh, and, and, and how they, they paved the way and what they represented and stood for in the ANC and the qualities that uh, they had. Well, don't exaggerate me. <laughs> it's following to this, it will be really exaggeration. But uh, for for whatever reason, Silo yesterday gave us a little bit of history how things uh, started. And uh, well, coming from this province, uh, you'll be more proud uh, that that's how it started. But themselves, they warned us as they went to Manga Wong 2012 to say tribalism must fall. They made a call to Msu, to Mzu, Lumpeti, Venda, whoever, Tanganan. As the Isilo yesterday emphasized that point. Yes, is a is a, is a, is a is a proud moment for all of us, but it should not remind you more of being a Zulu or coming from KZN rather than the overall projection of having the ANC that is United National Organization, mostly international organization. So that will give more pride than think like a, having some form of a tribal mm. thinking, mm. that must go. And they were never tribal. Uh, they came to make a serious call to say tribalism must go. But there's a, certainly a lot that every member of the ANC, no matter where you are in South Africa, across the world, that you continue to emulate uh, these giants. I, indeed. Uh, where else can you go? I was saying, talking somewhere, can't remember, to say, just sit here and think the name you know that was never an African National Congress, including Umtuana <laughs> Gaptelis, that he comes from and was cooked in the ANC. Every name you think is a big name, maybe besides the clerk and, and his cohorts, but everybody has been the part of this organization. So you cannot then put yourself outside of the organization where everybody has been the part of that organization. Even those that they sometimes get angry and leave, they find it very difficult, very cold, and come back here. Indeed, 
uh, standing here, even now, uh, you, you, you feel good, you feel very much elevated, you feel that South Africans are blessed of having such a string of leadership, including the present and the, the still living leadership that is there. NEC, ANC, NEC member Begitele, thank you so much sir, for your time this morning and happy birthday to the ANC once thank again. You. All right, ANC, NEC member Begitele, of course, he's one of the uh, top leaders that are here accompanying the uh, top six of so you can hear uh, in the uh, background uh, there, um, ululating and the excitement. And I was just hearing uh, MK from where we are, but I hear that uh, the uh, members of the MK are here and we can hear them chanting slogans in the background. But as you see there, members of the ANC Women's League, they've been here bright and early since uh, this morning. have been singing and dancing and uh, just part of today's uh, celebrations. It is a happy day uh, for uh, the ANC. It is a celebration. And of course, this is how in singing and in dance, that this is how uh, people celebrate 106 years of uh, the uh, ANC. And uh, again, as I said, of course, the most important today will be the fact that uh, they will be coming here to pay homage to the giants of the liberation movement. And here lies Dr. John Langalibalele Dube, the founding president of the ANC, elected in 1912 until 1917. It's going to be a long day uh, for uh, the ANC top six and all the ANC members who are here gathering on this momentous day. But we'll be here uh, throughout the day. We will move here once we're done. Uh, with this leg of uh, the program and later on we'll be moving uh, to uh, Guadugusa visiting the resting place of uh, Chief Albert Lutuli. I'm going to leave things here now uh, for now here at uh, Oshlang and I know my colleague Unati Pingose, he is uh, in East London. Unati, good morning to you. And uh, a very good morning to you and a warm welcome to all our SAPC News viewers. As we welcome you back to East London, indeed I can tell you that uh, the streets of East London are buzzing. The people are out and about going about their daily businesses, but by no means oblivious to the big event that is set to take place right here uh, in their backyard on Saturday when President of the ANC, Cyril Ramaphosa, delivers his maiden January 8th statement. It will be a monuma mo monumental event of course uh, as they will be here also to welcome the new leadership of the ANC that was elected just over a fortnight ago but prior to that um, we, we are told that uh, they will gather right here at the East London City Hall uh, to mark their 106th anniversary of this glorious movement um, as it marks its um, centenary rather it's, it's birthday celebrations today we are expecting that um, even those who are up in KZN at the moment uh, they will come down here uh, by Four o'clock, we're told that uh, the cake cutting is set to take place and the celebrations are expected uh, to get underway. And I can tell you that um, a lot of ANC members, uh, we've seen quite a number of them, some who are NEC members, some who are serving in government, deployees of the ANC, uh, who are already here to ensure that um, everything runs smoothly for this day and, of course, on the lead up uh, to the weekend. And uh, a whole host of events have been lined up um, on the lead up to the to, to the rally set to take place at Absa Stadium. And I can tell you that uh, a visit to a uh, to great place uh, tomorrow is also on the cards, where President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, along with his entire office uh, bearers, uh, the top six, are expected to meet with the Amakosa King and, of course, discuss some issues affecting the ANC and how they are planning to take the movement forward uh, and unite it, uh, given the fact that it has just returned from what has been a very, very bruising um, national elective conference. Uh, but Speaking to some of the locals here, they expressed um, some satisfaction at how things have turned out, uh, describing the outcome of the National Elective Conference um, as, as zebra outcomes, meaning that um, both factions were accommodated, and they say this bodes well for unity of the movement, unity that is expect, expected to be on display uh, when the movement celebrates its 106th anniversary um, on Saturday. And I can tell you that uh, inside there, we are not able to go inside there at the moment, but I can tell you that uh, preparations are well underway. Um, everything is just about in order. Uh, those who are responsible for 
For, for logistics, they are busy putting finishing touches, uh, but the state is set for, president, for ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa, along with his deputy, uh, Didi Mabuza, to, to lead the, the, the celebrations as the ANC uh, marks its 106th anniversary. And we do expect uh, that um, on Saturday, an open invitation has been sent to just about everyone. We understand that it's not just going to be an Eastern Cape event, it's not going to be an East London event, but those who are right here in East London, I can tell you that uh, they are feeling... Uh, uh, the heat. They are feeling that um, things are big things are set to happen o over the weekend. And uh, if you are in and around here, the Buffalo City area, one of the two metros uh, here in this Eastern Cape, and one that is still firmly in the hands of the ANC, you can tell that uh, a big event is happening and you can't miss it. There are posters just about everywhere reminding people of what will be happening. And as you are entering East London on the N2 from the Mtata side, there is a giant billboard. You can never, never miss. It. Uh, with the with, with the details of what will be happening and where it will be happening, of course, they 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 in rally, and we do expect that it's going to be a major major event. And uh, it's not the first time that um, uh, the East London has been um, given the honour of hosting such a massive event. We remember that uh, in 2009, on the lead up to the national elections, it was right here in East London at the very same venue uh, that the ANC held its January 8th statement. I was there as an ordinary South African, and I can tell you that it was packed to rafters so much that um, uh, adjacent stadiums, uh, Jan Smart Stadium, which is adjacent uh, to Absa Stadium, was also filled to capacity with big screens uh, beaming what was happening at the main event. And we do expect that uh, a similar event is set to happen this side. Speaking to Jesse Duarte, the Deputy Secretary General of the ANC, she did indeed confirm that uh, adjacent stadiums and adjacent venues to the stadium have also been booked to ensure that uh, the numbers are everyone is they are able to accommodate just about everyone who is set uh, to attend these celebrations and we do expect uh, that uh, it will be a massive venue and the weather gods are expected to play along and uh, checking the, the the weather forecast so everyone in and around east london who's able to come in is invited to come and be part of these celebrations uh, and ensure that uh, they welcome uh, the, the the new leadership of the anc and hear what they've got to say uh, on the lead up to to the year ahead and of course what the ANC has in plan on the lead up to what promises to be a highly contested 2019 general elections. But we are, we are still going to remain here and we'll ensure that uh, when those celebrations do take place at around 4 o'clock, we are able to give to you, we are able to beam those live to you. With that, allow myself to wrap now and hand back to you in, in Auckland Park. Thank you very much. Of course, that was SABC News reporter Unati Binkose. He is in Eastern Cape taking us through what we can expect throughout the course of the week there uh, with the backdrop of that January 8th statement as well as the other commemorations that are taking place in the Eastern Cape. Let's have a look now at our social media commentaries for the day. We'll start with our picture of the day. Uh, before we get into that, though, we're going to have a look at our poll that we have been running throughout this morning. And that is, of course, the ANC turning one. 106 years old today. Will 2018 be a unifying year for the ANC? Well, that is the poll that we asked. 36% of you are saying yes, 64% of you are saying no. And of course, we've also heard the views there from King Goodwill's Velatini calling for unifying forces within the ANC. Uh, this tweet coming in from Nkosi, I'm here to see what is happening, but I believe that that will never happen. Well, we're just going to have to wait and see upon that that statement uh, Michael says yes indeed I mean 106 years is no child's play a cope IFP UDM EFF were formed by all uh, former my ANC stalwarts but it's still standing today opposition parties are hoping otherwise but at my ANC is more unified than ever before well contradicting views coming in from our viewers keep your comments coming in we will be taking them throughout the course of the show having a look at our picture of the day now this one comes in the from Abhishek Baxi. Well, after years of apartheid and racial segregation, followed by two decades of isolation from international cricket, the skipper kissing his star bowler is a picture that South African cricket should be proud of. Hashtag SA versus India. Indeed, and it has been an electrifying week. Having a look at that game and how it has been played out, of course, has been marred by rain, but nevertheless, South Africans enjoying the cricket. Uh, let's have a look at uh, the comment of the day. Uh, this one comes in from Idol. The cricket enthusiast in me wants the rain to stop, but the human in me wants this rain to keep
keep showering its blessings on Cape Town. The city is facing severe drought. May this rain continue. Hope Africa never faces a drought anymore. Of course, that's all the backdrop there of uh, South Africa playing India versus uh, South Africa. Uh, many South Africans uh, taking the rain and watching it in the rain and embracing it. We do know that uh, Cape Town has been suffering uh, with weather. Well, on that note, that is a wrap-up of Newsroom. At least for now, let's take a short break. systems and robots have taken over a lot of what used to be done manually. Our accounting system is actually based on the cloud. Google nowadays can tell you where you parked your car. And Africa's entrepreneurs are using technology to create. With Pocket Maskwala, you can basically do all the, the services that you would do at the municipality physically by going there, but you can now do them on a mobile app. Join me, Pumele Lezondi, on Sundays at 9 p.m. on SABC News. When life takes a different turn. If I didn't eat the speak, he was going to affect me. Your will to persevere is ignited. I'm not a professional speaker, but I'll try my best to give you a word of inspiration. He was just trying to provide for his family. If you can't accept it, change it. If you cannot change it, accept it. And a new story begins. I made a resolve to myself. I'm learning something new. Ukilong, every Friday at 5.30. Be part of the life-changing journey. Welcome back. Well, the universities of KZN, Limpopo, Venda and the Val University of Technology have agreed to admit walk-ins after engaging with EFF students' organization over the weekend. However, the other universities have warned that walk-ins will not be accepted and security is expected to be tightened when the registration process gets underway today. The EFF Student Command says it stands by its call on prospective students who haven't registered to report to universities this morning. Meanwhile, representatives of universities and the Higher Education Department are scheduled to hold an urgent meeting in Pretoria today. The CEO of University of South Africa, Professor Ahmed Bauer, says the two parties hope to come to some sort of understanding of what needs to be done to avoid chaos at the beginning of the academic year. The Gauteng Education Department says it is expecting a huge number of parents seeking placements for their children for this year. While schools in the province open on the 17th of January, parents who still have admission challenges have been urged to go to their nearest admission centres between the 13th and the 14th for further assistance. The Gauteng MEC Panyazal Sufi says there are 31,000 pupils that still need to be placed before schools reopen and the province is ready for this mammoth task. From next weekend... Parents who have not registered their children for school and those who are still awaiting feedback on the status of their online application will be given feedback. And the number is growing. 31,000 pupils are still waiting to be placed. We are asking parents, if you have not applied in 2018, we will take the name of your child, but you must know that 31,000 people are ahead of you. So we have to wait for us to place that 31,000. By the time we come to you, if there are openings, we'll gladly place your child. But if there are no openings, we'll communicate with you that we can't place your child. This has placed increased pressure on the financial ability and teaching capacity in schools. Where schools have lost uh, or their enrollments have gone down, we will have to take those teachers and take them and redeploy them to where T uh, learners, learner numbers would have gone up. And that is the whole story about post-provisioning. And it's important that we clarify that particular matter, MEC. We received uh, a, th a very threatening letter from one organization that calls itself Solidarity. Uh, that They want to take us to court on this matter. <laughs> and my message is very simple. Bring it on. And has caused unhappiness from some quarters. 
uh, on the waiting list, what they've done, if you speak English to Zul, they skip you and they look for somebody who speaks Africans and pull that person upwards and undermine people that have applied on time. We told that school to stop. They've taken us to court. We are going to court this week. Uh, next week, uh, over fall. Over yeah. school, over World school over fall. Uh, we are going to court with them when? On Tuesday. On Tuesday, next week, Tuesday. Parents are urged to go to their nearest district offices to avoid disappointment when schools reopen. Nozin Dombimia, SABC News, Johannesburg. For more on the story, we are now joined in studio by a Gauteng Education spokesperson, Mr. Steve Mabona. Very good morning to you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Essentially, that's a big number, 31,000 pupils that are still set to be placed. Is the Gauteng Education Department ready for this? No, definitely we are ready. I mean, out of the, that 31,000, the 17,000, it's the parents who applied early. And the majority of them, we gave them alternatives, those that wanted to go to popular schools, and we have a limitation of those, about 403 of those. So we cannot uh, place everyone there. So we said, give them alternative uh, places, and uh, some did not want to accept those. So we are saying on the 13th and 14th, go to the centers at the districts, make sure that you are placed, because they will ask you, you know, which alternative, you know, you will see in the system, which uh, alternative, and they will place the learner there. Once they have placed, then we look into the 14,000 that we have from the late application, we will then place those because after they have applied about 22,000 of those, we have already placed 8,000. So we are waiting for those to give us space and then so that we can place more. In the event that a pupil is not placed, what are parents urged to do? Look, uh, that will not happen. I mean, we are very positive. Hence, we are calling upon parents to say, come to our open days. We have identified 13 and 14, it's a weekend. There's no excuse that one was not available. Go there if you have queries on placement so that when you move out of the center, your child will then be placed in a school. It might not be your choice, but it will be a school that will then uh, be considered for quality education. We are working very hard to make sure that we change the quality of education in all our schools. I mean, when you look at our metric results now, our township schools have performed you know, very well. I mean, they gave us over 80%. So that's an indication that there's a lot of improvement that is uh, coming from the township. And the, the investment that we are putting there, it's yielding results. But that's quite a tight crunch. I mean, it's the 8th of January today. Uh, schools are expected uh, to start on the 17th. Are you thinking in those nine days that all 31,000 uh, students and pupils are going to be placed? The worst case scenario will take us to the end of the month. But, I mean, in December, we're sitting at about 67,000. Now we are talking 31,000. So check on the, the, the period. It's quite a short period. So our officials are working tirelessly. I mean, every day we look, checking on the records, check on how are we doing in terms of placements. And those that parents are taking off us, they're assisting us. So hence we are calling upon them, those that have say, placements that are hanging that they have not accepted. Accept the placement so that we can assist to improve the, the quality of education. It does not help for you to say, I've applied for my first choice, and the only thing that I will take is my first choice. Well, let's have a look at uh, some of the other issues that the department might face. We heard MEC Panyaza Lasufi mentioning there um, the issue of going to a court case with a school in the VAL. Take us through uh, that issue in, in specific and similar issues that the department is facing with regards to segregation, maybe, in, in admissions. Definitely. I mean, we are in constant uh, liaison or negotiation with the African schools, so your war school, to say, let's assist each other. We can see that the system there is working very well. I mean, the good results are coming out there. It can tell you that uh, those are, are working very well. So we are saying, let's not celebrate the war schools, you know, in isolation. Let's celebrate everyone. If a learner is in Gauteng and uh, deserve to have access in any school, let's do that. Hence, we've negotiated, and in some other areas, I mean, in Krugersdorf, there's three African schools that they've said, you know, the department, we will work with you. They've started uh, creating space because it's a matter of, you know, going through the policy. Policy says, if one applies, you can't say, I'm not, you know, accepting you because of language. Accept, and if there's a need for you to accommodate the other medium uh, or, you know, go to a jewel, then you'll do that. 
So the case in point here, the one that we are appearing to, you know, in, in the Pretoria High Court tomorrow, actually, on Wednesday, the school is saying the HOD must not interfere in, in the admission. But we have, uh, you know, reason to do that. I mean, we know that the space, they went to, you know, take away the classes that were available for learners and created something else. I mean, rooms that are accommodating other things that are happening at school. But we are saying you foreseen that uh, the space and uh, you want to block the access of other people. Let's say you want to select only African-speaking learners and say the school is full. Meanwhile, the school is not full. So we have evidence that can tell you that uh, the school is not full. They decided to devise some means of saying the school is full. So hence we are going to court. We'll respond to their, their papers to say, as the department, this is what we have. And they probably the court will be fair enough to say, constitutionally, you can't deny anyone because of language. You need to make sure that you create that space. If there's a need, then you must make sure that uh, you improvise and uh, accommodate other language. Because it's a matter of a need. If there's a need, then uh, accommodate. You can't say, we want to be exclusively Africans. Then by that, you are saying no one must come in if they, they don't want to do Africans. Now, last year we saw a number of incidents that took place with regards to protests of leadership, uh, principals, um, teachers being affected in schools, not having qualified teachers, having teachers not come to school. How is the department going to ensure that those incidents that happened last year are not going to take place again this year and affect students? Look, the message is quite clear. Parents need to know that if you disrupt schooling, the results thereof, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to actually rectify. I mean, look at the case in point, um, talking about Clips Parade West. I mean, when you look at their results, they have uh, gone down severely. We have tried to intervene and we could not assist because it was probably too late. So we are saying, uh, again, there's a contestation of a principal. They are saying, they're going to disrupt. We are saying, it's not an easy thing to disrupt. You might see yourself as doing the right thing, but you must know that uh, the repercussions thereof, they are dire, because it's not easy for you to go back and say, let's rectify. So we'll work with the stakeholders and make sure that we have principles that are accepted in the communities, but we cannot be held at ransom to say, we disrupt and uh, you, you know, to toe the line. We are saying, let's move out of the school and come negotiate and uh, you know, find a solution on the way forward. But how is the department going to ensure that that doesn't happen? Are there increased security measures? Are there any other contingency plans that have been put in place to ensure that doesn't happen? Look, to a certain extent, we need to appeal to, to the communities to say, let's uh, not lose you know, sight. I mean, let's be focused and, and make sure that we think about the future of our children. I mean, you can have as much as you can in terms of the security and the police and everyone else. But the environment that is full of security and police and all that. It's not an, an environment that is conducive for teaching and learning. I mean, you know, learners will be probably inquisitive. I mean, when we talk about the primary school, they will probably, you know, peeping through the windows, wanting to know what is happening outside. That process is destabilizing us. So the solution is for us to interact with the communities, parents, work with us. Let's not disrupt schooling because it's not taking us anywhere. Thank you very much uh, for joining us in studio, Paul's Gauteng Education Spokesperson, Mr. Steve Mabola, taking us uh, through the influx of those 31,000 pupils that still need to be placed this year, as well as the Gauteng Education Department's plan for 2018 and the rollout. Well, the identification process of the bodies of the victims of a train crash between Kronstadt and Henneman is expected to resume today. 19 people were killed and more than 100 injured in the crash which happened last Thursday. Several other people are still missing. The Shosholoza mail train was travelling from Port Elizabeth to Gauteng when it collided with a truck at a level crossing. Meanwhile, the family members of a 14-year-old boy who is still in hospital following the train crash in the Free State on Thursday say they are happy that all their relatives who were on the train are still alive. Six members of the same family were among the scores of people injured in the collision.
Indeed, uh, we'll give you visuals now of our ANC top six that are going to be visiting the various grave sites in Otlange uh, today in KZN. We have our reporters on the ground, Yandam Klongo, who has been taking us through that. And of course, we've also seen newly elected ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa there. He's making his way onto uh, the grave site. Then we'll, we'll continue to give you updates and visuals on the store in KZN. For now, though, let's take a short break. Do stay tuned to Newsroom. Meningitis is a potentially deadly disease that affects more than one million people worldwide each year. Well, it's an infection of the, the lining of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and it's usually, it's caused by a variety of uh, bacteria. And also, importantly, with fungal meningitis, there's no transmission from person to person. In South Africa and elsewhere in the world, the ministries of health itself have, have recognized this as an important disease to prevent. And vaccines have been introduced into immunization, routine immunization programs. It's really important to prevent. And the best way to prevent is to have people know their HIV status, start antiretroviral treatment as soon as possible. For all your health news, join Health Talk every Saturday from 9 to 10. This is your Midday Report. Good afternoon. How will you feel? I assume as president of the Republic of Kenya. Let's take a look at how African markets and currencies are performing now. The central bankers say the success of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is just a bubble. Breaking stories, detailed economy and sport. Tune in to Midday Report every Monday to Friday from 12 p.m. Climate change. It is normal for the weather to be severe. We have had instances of catastrophic weather. There are recordings of extremes that date back to the 1600s, like the grapefruit-sized ale in France. However, in South Africa, we have mostly experienced floods, droughts, and strong winds. All these extreme weather events are normal and always expected to happen time after time. Our beautiful planet has been warming up due to human activities, like the burning of fossil fuels and production of energy. Our dependence on coal and oil is the main problem. Mm -hmm. We need to make a big shift to the renewable forms of energy and to nuclear energy yeah. and use those two increasingly in combination. So it, it is very likely that we are going to overshoot this 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Yes. Perhaps we can still avoid the 2 degree threshold. But, but we, we need to change the way in which we live on the planet. Yes. And that is a very, very big challenge. Power stations deforestation, combustion of fossil fuels in cars and methane released from landfills. Greenhouse gases are natural gases essential for needed warmth of the earth by acting like a blanket. The thicker the blanket, the warmer our planet becomes. At the same time, the earth's oceans are also absorbing some of this extra carbon dioxide, making them more acidic and less hospitable for sea life. Global temperature rises increase the occurrence of high fire danger conditions Currently, the extreme weather occurrences are becoming more frequent. We are expecting gradual increases in temperature in Cape Town, which means more evaporation, mm. drier vegetation along mm. the Cape mm. South Coast, mm. so <coughs> more fire-prone conditions. But unfortunately, because of climate change, these seasons of drought in the southwestern Cape yes. are also projected to occur more and more frequently as we move deeper into the century. So we, I think, our vulnerability in Cape Town to drought and water scarcity is unfortunately only going to increase. Rainfall futures remain uncertain, but significant rainfall reductions are projected to occur from the west to east. At minus three degrees Celsius, Western Cape receives lots of rain and snow. Currently, we are approaching a 1.5 degree mark and Western Cape will become drier, potentially devastating impacts on livestock. Let's all be responsible with our emissions and electricity usage. 
For more climate change, catch us every Friday on Weather or Not 10 to 5 South African Standard Time. Meet Tebomia. In 2012, when he was just 17 years old, he got arrested. Today, at 22, looking through what used to be his cell, it all seems surreal. He was released from Logob Juvenile's Correctional Center in Johannesburg early this year. His 10-year sentence for housebreaking and robbery was reduced to five years. Growing up in the streets of Zondi in Soweto, he never imagined he would end up behind bars. My friends were good people until where we led each other astray. We influenced each other with bad habits like smoking. We started smoking benzene, season it through. Then it continued, sape mitsango, drank alcohol and all this other stuff, like going partying and everything. Then it escalated. I didn't have anything to, to smoke, like I was already hooked into Nyaope. So I didn't have nothing to smoke and my friends all were turning their backs on me. They didn't want to give me some smoke and everything because you have to have silly games open in Nyaope, meant for himself, because now yo, it's other habit. Like, you, you can't sleep if you, you haven't smoked or you get cramps, swimming. Like, yo, you, you, you gain this disease on us with your puma because of the man. So that night I knew I won't sleep if I don't get the fix. What was meant to be a once off thing didn't go according to plan. Already, the next door is uh, I'm respond. And then, uh, because I'm scared, I couldn't find a proper place for me to hide. I just climbed the tree. Like, on that yard, there's a, maybe a garden in Ganja, so there's a big tree. I climbed that tree up and stayed there until I got arrested. He began to introspect and envisioned a better life for himself. Everyone is looking at his own sentence. Like, Uti, Mena, I'm raping Mubanba, Nikelinguaku. It's none of your business. Just when I begin the Wazaku. Yeah, well, because you can also fall a victim if you want to stand up for that, for that person. Today, the sky is the limit for Tsepo. At the current moment, uh, I'm not working. I'm still working on how to compile my own book, yeah, well, like an inspirational book, or maybe take a movement in motivating the schools, the youth. In his neighborhood, where he spent most of his childhood, still lives his sister. She witnessed how her siblings' actions led him to jail and how after his release, he returned a changed man. He has changed his life. I'm just lost for words. He's dedicated his life to God. Nonzuzlamini for Morning Live in Johannesburg. You. Welcome to Newsroom. We're coming to you live from our Auckland Park studios in Johannesburg. If you just tuned in, just call 10 o'clock. I'm Shante Yankees. Firstly, we'll start off with our question of today. We ask you, how should universities better manage chaos during walk-ins? Send us your comments on at SABC Newsroom. Of course, this is called 
from the student organizations as well as political parties endorsing everybody uh, to uh, walk in if they do qualify. Uh, well, this one coming in from Nkutalo, if the administrators can work hard, I think this can actually help reduce chaos. I don't know, we're going to have to see with a lot of those walk-ins. Ikona says, a right to be educated is for everyone. So is a rural child and there are no means for them to apply on time. We know that universities must change their attitude and we need a parallel system to place students directly to avoid educational segregation. And of course, our poll question of the day, we are asking if the ANC turns 106 today, will 2018 be a unifying year for the ANC? Of course, there have been calls from King Goodwill's Wellettini emphasizing unification in the ANC. Having a look at the poll here, 36% of you believe that yes, it could be a unifying year. However, that 64% of you are still saying no. A lot more needs to be done with the factionalism within the party. Atini says, happy birthday to the people's movement. Opinion, yes, African National Congress it can come out more united this year. After the conference, everyone was waiting for the last slate to open. Opposition party, we saw united ANC. This one coming in from Nazim. Well, of course, uh, let's not fool ourselves. Uh, on this one, the ANC will never be uh, unified by any person at any time. Well, possibly they have uh, a long way to go. We are going to be crossing over to uh, some of the commemorations that are currently taking place there in Durban. These are the live visuals coming in from Otlange. We are expecting the ANC Treasurer General, Mr. Paul Mashatile, to address um, this morning's proceedings. We've also seen the likes of uh, Cyril Ramaphosa as well as the other top six in attendance today. And we believe that Nkosazan Lamini Zuma is also there. Is this showing the united and the unity uh, that the ANC is so desperately needing? Well, we're just going to have to wait and see. With that being said, a very good morning to you. Let's have a look at your headlines this morning. The ANC turns 106 years old today. ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa is expected to deliver the annual January 8th statement in the Eastern Cape this coming Saturday. Well, several universities finally agreed to admit walk-ins after engaging with EFF students' organisation at the weekend. The identification process of the bodies of the victims of a train crash between Kronstadt and Hedenmann is expected to resume today. And new sporting highlights, the Proteas will resume play at the crease later this morning after rain prevented play on day three of the first Crick test between uh, Proteas and India at Newlands in Cape Town. The Vitae Celtic will also be moving two places on the log to six after a 2-1 win against Golden Arrows. Well, the ANC turns 106 years old today. ANC President Sir Ramaphosa will deliver the annual January 8th statement in the Eastern Cape on Saturday. The tradition dates back to 1972, when then-President Oa Tambo delivered the first January 8th statement to celebrate the ANC's 60th anniversary. Otambo used the occasion to get freedom fighters to intensify the armed struggle. The newly elected ANC president is expected to use his inaugural speech to call for unity. The January 8th statement is traditionally used by the ANC to convey the party's message to its members. The first January 8th statement by the party's leader, Oliver Tambo, this at a time when most of the ANC leadership and members were either in prison, in hiding or scattered all over the world. The NC January 8th statement assumed great significance during the difficult years of exile. At all times, the theme of the January 8th statement is informed by an appraisal of the internal and external challenges the organization faces. Such an analysis enables the NC to identify and minimize both the weakness and the threats it faces. At the same time, it enables the NC to exploit the opportunities that are available as it builds itself into a robust machinery. 
there has been a great deal of coherence from within the ANC. So when the time came, the January 8th statement, people expected the ANC to just emphasize some of the priorities that uh, the party is already pursuing in government. So the speech was usually used to recapture the national mood, to say to the people that uh, these are priority areas that we are going to actually emphasize. In most of the times, we have never seen a groundbreaking announcement when it comes to policy position of the ANC being delivered through the January 8th. Because the party is in government, they are uh, implementing their mandate in government. What they usually did with the January 8th statement was just to amplify a certain point for the year. It also served the purpose of ensuring that all NC members read from the same hymn sheet. Doing so ensure that all members of the NC, irrespective of their location, carry the same message. With the NC reasserting itself as a strategic political center, the January 8th statement now looms large. The statement prefigures what the present state of the nation address would entail. This year, it is a very different January 8th statement. I mean, I remember very well that some years in the past we used to say it is very different, but it was on a gradualist approach. But now the problem is that the NC that went into uh, the elective conference in December a few years ago, it came out a very different ANC. They have taken radical policy positions that uh, I think the nation and even the international community will need a voice as to what do they mean in terms of the programs of the year? What do they mean? those policy positions that they've taken with regard to expropriation of land without compensation, free education, what will they translate into when it comes to programs of the year? That is, I think, the level of anxiety that this year's speech comes against. With an overwhelming 1.2 strong members, the gathering for the January 8th statement has become a sort of annual pilgrimage. At this gathering, the NC converts and their fellow travelers congregate to receive an unmediated message and directives from the NC president. The reality is that the new president of the NC, Mr. Sil Ramaphosa, he has now inherited a party that has taken a very radical stance. But on the other hand, the nation wants to see changes within the ANC. So my view is that he's caught in between. Is he going to be realistic? He's going to have to balance severely than we've seen before. Well, let's cross over live to Durban in Otlange. We do know that ANC Treasurer General Paul Mashatile is currently taking the podium, kicking off the proceedings there at the 106 celebrations in Durban. Uh, in terms of what the officials want to do, uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Director, I'm going to. Uh, you already given us an instruction to be very brief. <laughs> so allow me to be very brief by summarizing of this significant gathering. Why are we all here? Well, I am under the impression that all of what all of us that are here is predominantly members of the ANC and we all know our history never be a member of the NC without knowing your roots and where you're coming from. But again, let me take this opportunity to thank specifically the national leadership of the NC through the president and congratulate you, President, and you getting officially appointed to lead the country. Your skills is known. I don't have to dwell on that. And again, with the entire membership that the National Elective Conference you know, declared. Uh, let me not sort of go through all the leagues and the individuals that are here according to your individual ranks. On behalf of the Duga family, we are all welcome. And uh, through your president, I'd like to say that your presence here, I can assure you that Amatambo, Kababamukuri, Mamsaini, Ayanyagaza, Mwuti, Mwaziri, Mwuti, Mwensi, Mwonisti, Mwalega, so Mwuti, Nizo Sanganyelela, Nizo Chola Amanda, the inspiration, Mwuti. Yes, you are committing to say you are going to deliver on behalf of our people in the country. We all understand the plight that our people are faced with. 
things that need to be done. I don't have to tell them that. Every one of us that is here knows. Let me again say this in closing to say, Songon Yoba say that. Some members on Boto. If the Bang Wooty, Uncool, no Boko Jovelela, was of Tagasela Wooty, Uholy. Now, one game membership, the ANC is of Sabans and Sugala, we are pumping of Bambisan, who was a Sigma Sri or Ketwin in 2019, since the show of the ANC in Tatina, we are a leader, Israel, and then I'm born and what was there. Viva in si viva. Viva in si om slik viva. Viva in si yum slik viva. Viva SSB viva. Viva kosatu viva. Viva sanko viva. Viva sanko viva. Our viva ma volunti our viva. Our viva ma volunti our viva. Viva the undying spirit of our comrade. Umay ulang al malal ma fuzal adube viva. Viva the undying spirit of comrade lang al malal ma fuzal. Viva! Comrade President of the African National Congress, NEC Yonke, no pala chigelele, nonke, treacher away to chigelele. Ikulu zonke is African National Congress. Kai nabatan to African National Congress. Gama fishan inji, which was cut is the way inja. Got on fisu uti giti monga mail. African National Congress. Jebo stalo, wale riji. Enkulu ya sete win. Ogyo na namtanji. Jago busu figiri wanyatele la wazo nyagazisa. Ama tambo kama fuguzena. Ukubega uyo nyagazisa. Ama tambo kasemi. Ukubega njalwe ngale nzonke za sekeze ten. Unyagazisa matambo. Siti tina. Eskulele klo NC. Sase sa kukela wona. Si agwa mkela. Gezate si mshope. Si 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 hone. Si hone munga melika kongo lose. Konke. Si si misele ukomandwa. Ngoba wasfundisa ukongo lose. Wati masi ketiwe inko keni. Si funu kutisiti. Panti na inka ndono panti. Pambi ne yuniti kongo lose. Pambi ili. Ya munga kuhu. Manza, away to long live NC, long live. Viva President Cyril Ramaphosa, viva. Manza, ya fisu bingelela amalunga a National Executive Committee, a holwa u President Cyril Ramaphosa. Ya fisu bingelela ama PEC members wonke ANC. Ya fisu bingelela ama regions. Onke especially ila eskona etewini. Umage sila na muta si chwaele uguzala si ya bonga mdenin wagatu. Baba, eh, mfwe tu, zente, zente. Ya fisa nje, no kanga. Ya fisu bonga. Imdene mningi ya makawe omzabalazu. Iti ngobayaza lwa emzabalazu ini. Imi sikaba nguti i umzabalazo yona. Kodu mde nwaga tube, mde nwaga seme, no mde nwaga lchuli, no mde nwaga lembete. Ba ispone lo esugi. Ngoba ondea on ba nguenye yomzabalazo. Nyakolo wakuto putbaga tube, bamba alwa batabazi yuguti, banga masosho mkonto wesizu. Not trained inside the country, but trained outside the country. About appropriate um zabalazo, ube yibo. Kwa nga funu kute mdeni wakatube, nga bongu kutika malika baba u John langa liba lele tube, linga abinje i monument, e kunjulu wangu mshaka 8 January, na mango kusuku lo kuzalwa kwa ke. Umasia kwi national conference, itube institute, islege lelega kulu la kwa zulu natali, he based the UKZN, we research on the question of land. 
enye yezinto idube institute ephambili kuyo ukubuyiswa komhlaba owathathwa kubantu abamnyama mawubuye umhlaba mawubuye siyafisa ukubonga lokho angigcina ngokubonga national executive committee ngokuthi ize izoqala la kwiliba likababudube kwiliba lakaseme kwiliba lakalithuli ubabulithuli siyafisa ukubonga lana ke ngoba mhlamba abanyabazi idilike ngeyinkani national leadership viva president siri ramaphosa viva viva comrade treasurer general paul viva viva ace mahashule hg viva viva begi qele nec member viva viva comrade senzo mkhunu nec member viva Viva Gomren Kosaza ne Damini Zuma NEC member Viva Amanda Siabonga Mangoli say I'm told that uh, <coughs> if family ga our former president to who say meba corner nabo so I want to also welcome them. I don't know where they are sitting. We welcome you as well. We will be later going to, to the house. Makabani, uh, let's take this opportunity now to uh, welcome Mungameli uh, so that he's able to make his remarks. Ramaposa Dumela, Dumela. Ramaposa Dumela, Dumela. Posa Dumela, you called me already. Yo Dumela, era ma posa Dumela, Dumela, era ma posa Dumela, Dumela, era ma posa Dumela, 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 Dumela. Viva President Ramaphosa, viva! viva. Uh, I'm sure, comrades, uh, you agree the president doesn't need any introduction. Agange na kulmenat. Dumela, vera maposa, Dumela, vera maposa, Dumela. Amanda! Amanda! Viva ANC, viva! Viva! Viva ANC! Did you know the big hole digging started in 1871 and ended on the 14th August 1914. The hole produced 2,722 kgs of diamonds. However, one diamond as huge as 490 carat of stone found in the open prior 1868 gave them the interest to dig. Extracted from 22.5 million tons of soil. Today, the hole sits at a breathtaking 214 meters deep. 
Kimberley Big Hole attracts tourists from all over the world, taking a vintage tram past the city, then cycling around the Big Hole. An exciting opportunity and an absolute must for those with the spirit of adventure is a Kruger Park Night Game Drive. The railway station itself is already a sight to behold and offers gracious colonial style buildings and serves as the departure and arrival point for all train journeys. I wanted to dress with my best colour, being awarded to do the Serpentine Pavilion is the highest um, commission in my career and I wanted just to come and show me with my, with my best clothes, and that is blue. Catch trains travel every Sunday from 12 to 1 for all the global travel and leisure trains. A warm welcome to one of your favorite weekly review analysis programs, Media Monitor. So let's look at the race itself. It's just becoming a personality contest where people just want somebody to guard their own vested interest, and I feel that the country's at a point now where we need some sort of change. It is ANC policy that they will have to implement. We fairly know the direction the ANC wants to take. As a leader, you have to implement. So what was it like on the ground in Kenya? Well, the country is divided. It, the country is very divided. I think within the country for me, the one person that I criticize severely and I'm not very happy with his approach is Raila Odinga with him pulling out. Stay tuned to Media Monitor and catch on analysts unpacking top stories every Sunday from 9 a.m. Our stories. How do I begin? Our lives. When all seems to fail, we will raise our voices a bit louder for our justice. Well, I went into absolute shock. My whole body was shaky. I couldn't hold a phone, but there he was. I couldn't believe the nonchalant that they were still in the area two weeks later. Times when the justice system is not able to help us with our individual battles. I'm willing to do anything. What are you doing? Nothing. Feeling sort of as you know, it's not an option. These are our stories on Cutting Edge Channel 404. A very good morning to you and thank you so much indeed for choosing Morning Life. But I want to know yeah. the basic thing. Chris Alder Lewis, SABC News, in Parktown, Johannesburg. Zimbabwe, Mzondelebej, SABC News, Luanda, Angola. Let's take a look at your market indicators. Thanks for staying with Morning Live. Let's bring you your sports news. Take a look at your satellite image. Set the agenda for the day with Morning Live. Well, today we discuss the general practitioner or GP. So the quality of the doctors coming through our medical schools is excellent. Your GP is your family doctor. Your GP is your first point of care. Who determines how much a consultation fee should be? We set up networks of general practitioners and one of the conditions of the network was to agree to charge a certain fee. Specialists are specialists. We can't take away their role. We can't take away 
what they do for for each patient in their disease entity. Our specialist colleagues as well uh, don't appreciate patients coming straight off the street as it were to see them. They are highly trained. For health tips that will help you to adopt healthy living, catch Health Talk every Saturday from 9 to 10. Welcome back to News Room. Well, of course, we apologize for the break on transmission with regards to the feed uh, from the ANC commemorations that are taking place in Durban, Otlange. Well, continuing with the ANC 106th anniversary celebrations, newly elected ANC Secretary General Ace Magashule says the ANC leadership that has been elected will work together. Magashule says 2018 is a year that unity should prevail in the ANC. This is the year where we are going to make sure that we are united. We are going to work together uh, as different, uh, when they were before conference, there were different groupings. And I know it's the mood of conference. Always after conference, we accept the leadership which has been installed uh, or elected. And we move on. That's how the ANC works. That's the character of the African National Congress. Uh, the branches have spoken and we need to move forward. In my link, I spoke about you and the other top leaders of the ANC being here to honor your founding fathers. But what you also did yesterday is visit uh, Isilo, who King Goodwill Zolitin. Apparently, he called all the feuding parties together and said, let's hold hands and start afresh. How did that go? Well, it went well, uh, and uh, because of the history of the ANC, you must remember our kings, uh, our traditional leadership played a role uh, during the establishment, uh, the foundation of the ANC, uh, even in the eight, 1846. Uh, uh, some of the leaders, uh, particularly Udinizul, and many others, when the ANC was established uh, in 1912 in, in Bloemfontein, the kings, uh, the traditional leadership played a very important role, and that's why we fought, let's start here and move to Eastern Cape and we'll be moving throughout the country. Uh, and the king said to us, uh, remember this is the movement, not only of the ANC members, it's the movement of the people of South Africa as well as the continent. ANC's Cyril Ramaphosa has reiterated his call for the party to unite and dismantle factionalism within its ranks. Ramaphosa says ANC leaders and members must work together to strengthen the party, irrespective of which candidate they supported in the recent elective Congress. He was speaking during a courtesy visit to Zulu King Goodwill's Wellettini in Nongoma in northern KZN, accompanied by four members of the top six. Dubbed the program of unity and renewal of the party, Newly elected ANC President Ramaphosa leading the ANC's top structure to introduce them to King Goodwill Zuelatini. Unity topped the agenda. The ANC was deeply divided ahead of its elective conference, which saw Ramaphosa defeat in Kosazana Dlamini Zuma. Ramaphosa cautioned the party against factionalism and called for unity. The contest that we had is over. The contest that we had over leadership is over and in fact the winner of this contest is the African National Congress. Ramaphosa said expropriation of land without compensation must be done in a way that wouldn't hinder the country's economy, agricultural production and stability. As we take land, we do not harm the economy, we do not harm agricultural production and we do not sacrifice food security. King Goodwill also stressed that there must be unity among the warring factions. He congratulated the party on a successful elective conference but warned that the newly elected leadership has a mammoth task ahead. This is the uniform that you're taking. Today the whole country looks up to you for this system leadership. Leadership that pulls and doesn't destroy. Leadership that pulls on the works, 
of all those who have gone before you. The king also called on the ANC to ensure that the role of traditional leaders is respected. Ramaphosa presented the Zulu monarch with cattle as a gesture of goodwill. The king returned the favor with an Nguni cowhide shield. The leaders are set to visit the graves of former ANC leaders in the province on Monday. and recourse tackles constitutional issues. When South Africa became a constitutional democracy, we had a fairly sound legal system in place requiring the constitution to guide the direction in which it must go and the way in which it must be refashioned. The Justice Ministry, the custodian of human rights. We actually uh, have a, a plan to come up with a comprehensive uh, review um, of our human rights instrument. Advocates dealing with evidence. Sometimes you have to use a crook to catch a crook. So mm. we expected that the uh, credibility would really be taken to task. You try and consult your witnesses and prepare them as best as you can. Hashtag rights with Dumi Lamatez on legal issues every Sunday at 2 o'clock Central African time. An exciting opportunity and an absolute must for those with the spirit of adventure is a Kruger Park night game drive. The railway station itself is already a sight to behold and offers gracious colonial style buildings and serves as the departure and arrival point for all train journeys. I wanted to dress with my best colour being awarded to do the Serpentin Pavilion. It's the highest um, commission in my career and I want to just to come and show me with my, with my best clothes, and that is blue. Catch trains travel every Sunday from 12 to 1 for all the global travel and leisure trains. With the, um, the stories of abuse from the other eight, um, but they haven't been ready to, to pursue any angles. They, they've, they've offered their support. Uh, they've offered the comfort to the, to, to the eight, and it's been an amazing journey. It feels like your heart actually literally sunk in your shoes. It wasn't a long encounter. Um, uh, I think at the time I, I froze. The way the criminal justice system deals with sexual violence is problematic. And I don't know, unless there's a fundamental change in many things, the way prosecutors deal with uh, the victim in the matter. For all investigative insights, stay tuned to Special Assignment every Saturday at 17.30. Welcome back. Well, President Jacob Zuma has announced a special official funeral for post laureate Professor William Kiropetse Hositsile, who died last week at the age of 79. Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa will deliver the eulogy at the funeral, which will take place on the 16th of this month. Friends and scholars of the late Professor Hositsile gathered to honor him through poetry. Hositile spent many of his years in exile in New York. During that time, he worked um, tirelessly to um, bring attention um, uh, to South Africa, um, uh, to his American counterparts, to his African American counterparts. But he also diligently worked to form a kind of transatlantic. He was really a, a, a bridge builder. Many of those gathered knew him personally. They cited his poems in his honor. I was delighted to come to his work 
through another poet I loved, but loved his work. He is one of the prime poets of what we could call global black consciousness, right? So let us consider his exile in terms of the larger exile that we might call blackness. His diasporic vision for black freedom was a vision for human freedom. And he saw and gave, uh, if you say what they want for future generations to take away, you were talking earlier right after the tribute, about his intergenerational sense of a global understanding both within South Africa, but also here in the States. Speakers are very, very, very important. One thing that we can say is that we'll have the deputy president as the, as the, as the chief mourner uh, at the funeral. While his legacy will be cherished in his homeland of South Africa, his memory is sure to live on in American hearts. So, Fimukwen, SABC News. Well, the universities of KZN, Limpopo, Venda and the Val University of Technology have agreed to admit walk-ins after engaging with EFF students' organizations at the weekend. However, the other universities have warned that walk-ins will not be allowed and security is expected to be tightened when the registration process gets underway today. The EFF Student Command says it stands by its call on prospective students who have registered to report to universities this morning. Meanwhile, representatives of universities and the Higher Education Department are scheduled to hold an urgent meeting in Pretoria today. The CEO of University South Africa, Professor Ahmed Bauer, says the two parties hope to come to some sort of understanding of what needs to be done to avoid chaos at the beginning of the academic year. ANC Youth League Secretary General Njabulo Nzuza says it is reckless for some politicians to call on prospective students to go to universities and apply. Nzuza says only those who have applied and have been accepted should make their way to the various institutions of high learning. Well, we've made it quite clear that all those who qualify who have applied and who have been accepted to universities must go to universities knowing very well that the formula to ascertain who is poor and who is not is already there. The infrastructure through NSFAS, which has been successfully filtering students who is rich, who is qualifying, has been there. So there is actually no crisis. We are actually worried by some leaders, uh, you know, like uh, the, lead, the caliber of Blade in Zimande, who is proving now to be uh, degraded, you know, a communist. It's like Moody's came and downgraded him. Now he's talking that free education is not attainable, which is an issue we had been raising previously, that he had become become an enemy of free education while he was a minister of the ANC supposed to be implementing it. Now he shows his true colors that he's never supported it, you know. But we are saying to students who have applied, who qualify, they must go to universities and actually get access. We are warning against populist, uh, you know, kind of displays that is being done by the EFF to say everyone must simply go to the University of Higher Learning and they will be accepted. People have died in queues before because of such reckless statements. Right, so you're not in support of uh, walk-ins? We, we are in support of some people who will walk in where universities are subject to walk-ins. They are institutions that have been known historically to not take walk-ins. Those are institutions like VETS, and we've been fighting with them to say they must be taking more people. We are encouraging others to file their applications through CAO. There will be representatives from the Progressive Youth Alliance in the form of SASCO, ANC, Youth League, and YCL in campuses to assist all those students who will be coming through. But this recklessness of saying just anyone must go, it is wrong and it is uncalled for, it is populist and dangerous. Will subsidize free higher education for poor and working class undergraduate students in their first year of study at public universities has led to a great deal of confusion. Well, this week, tertiary institutions are bracing themselves ahead of the reopening of the 2018 academic year. 
we talked to the Deputy Minister of Higher Education and Training, Mr. Puti Manamela, about the readiness of the tertiary institution for fee-free education. Very good morning, Chief Minister. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Well, there does seem to be a lot of confusion on how this is actually going to be rolled out and uh, who actually applies for it. Take us through what the reality for this is on the situation on the ground. Okay. Look, I think firstly, the um, is at least with regards to um, students who are supposed to be beneficiaries of fee-free higher education, there's no confusion. Uh, we are meeting with the uh, university vice chancellors, the principals of Tivet colleges, students' organizations, uh, and various other sectors uh, today throughout into the week uh, to understand why, uh, what could be the uh, challenges that they're confronted with. But essentially, what the president announced was that over the next five years, we will be facing in fee-free higher education at post-school uh, uh, education and training institutions, meaning universities and Tibet colleges. So for the first time entrants who qualify, whose parents' joint income does not exceed 350,000 rands, they qualify for fee-free higher education. Is that of 2018? That's 2018. Okay. So if you've made an application to a university, you've been granted a space, you've made an application to the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, they will make an assessment of whether you do qualify for this, and then they will give you a buzzer. And for those students who are doing their second, third, and fourth year, those students, their uh, uh, loan will then be turned into a grant. Uh, and thirdly, all of these students will obviously have to enter into some academic uh, performance commitment and post uh, uh, you know, uh, post uh, uh, school commitment, be it community service or anything of the sort. So it's not essentially free uh, in that uh, students will not pay fees, but there should be commitment that, I mean, uh, uh, commitments on their part in terms of what is it that they're going to do after they get qualified for the country. Okay, now the presidency also reported that it's not only, only going to be covering um, tuition, it's also going to be subsidizing transport costs and accommodation costs. Uh, where essentially uh, <coughs> are they going to be getting the money from this? Well, Treasurer will be making an announcement. The Minister of Finance, as part of his budgetary statement, will make an announcement in terms of the allocation with regards to this. Are universities ready to handle this? Registrations are taking place this week and lectures yes. are, st are set to start in the next couple of days. Yes, universities are ready to handle this. Um, there is, I think, the, the idea that this is spectacularly new is actually very ridiculous. Uh, universities have been doing this for the last three to four years since uh, there was a parent, I think, who collapsed at the University of Johannesburg about three to four years uh, ago. Universities introduced uh, 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 online registration which has been working perfectly well through uh, uh, the department's Apply Now program and career guidance uh, program, uh, KETA. We have reached out to uh, you know, students and to say to them, this is what we expect from you in terms of uh, you know, making application. And lastly, uh, you know, covering uh, uh, tuition, transport, and accommodation has been happening at TVET colleges. And NASFAS has been covering all of those uh, you know, for students uh, you know, between, I mean, who are, uh, uh, whose parents earn between uh, zero and 125,000. What is new is that this is now extended to those whose parents earn uh, jointly to 350,000 rands. And what I must emphasize, which is quite critical, is that more than 90% of household will be covered by this pronouncement by the president. And I think with what is also more critical is the fact that it does not necessarily address the available spaces. So we're not all of a sudden going to have new spaces available. It is still on the basis of existing spaces at universities. The question of the expansion of the post-school sector is part of government's long-term strategy, which is dealt with separately from what the president announced last year. Now let's have a look at the issue of walk-ins <coughs> and the capacity. We do not want to see a repeat of that UJ situation that happened three years ago. What is your stance on that? Well, it's not my stance. The um, uh, we are requesting parents and students who have not applied last year uh, but who since receiving their metric results feel strongly that they need to go and further their studies 
to use the department's central application uh, 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 clearing system, which uh, in essence will then allocate them to available spaces in all the universities. We strongly discourage uh, the walk-ins. Walk we discourage parents and students to go physically to universities. I'm aware that there are four universities as we speak where there are long queues um, and those universities have in any way prepared themselves for those. They've got personnel who are assisting those who are on the queues. But we dis strongly discourage this and more so that it will mainly be those students who are on our uh, catch system who will be given preference because it is much easier for us to allocate those students to available spots. Let us use a system which has been trusted, which has been used for the last few years, and which we believe has been able to allocate students. Well, we do know sports. that uh, higher education is meeting with tertiary institutions today. What are we expecting to be the details and the outcome of this meeting? Well, nothing spectacular other than, you know, us getting a sense from University of Chancellors if the e so it's essentially a troubleshooting meeting, if, if, if I may put it that way. It's day one. Uh, the president has made the announcement. How effectively is it being implemented? Are there areas which we need to be concerned about? And as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, on day one, there has essentially not been, uh, you know, major causes for concern. We'll, uh, we'll be monitoring the situation over the next week or two to see how smooth the process is. But we believe that at the time when learning and teaching should uh, uh, commence at universities and at TVET colleges, that it will. This impending chaos that many people are talking about, we do not really anticipate it. Thank you very much for joining us here on Newsroom. Of course, that was Deputy Minister of Higher Education, Mr. Buti Manamela, uh, talking to us here on Newsroom. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. Well, for the better... For the better part of 2017, the labour and employers sector and the economy has been dominated by job losses, retrenchment and low growth. The depressed labour market shed over a million jobs mainly in the mining sector. The business environment has also been subdued by low economic growth, decline in business confidence and a lack of clear policy direction. Well, to discuss the 2018 prospects for labour and the business environment, we are now joined in studio by General Secretary of the South African Federation of Trade Union, SAFTU, Mr. Zwelinzi Mavavi, and the National Employers Association of South Africa, NIASA, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Gerard Papenfuss. A very good morning to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Firstly, in terms of labour and business, to you both, what are the prospects for 2018? I'll start with you, Mr. Howard. Well, I, 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 there's nothing to suggest that uh, the trend that we saw in 2000 uh, in, in, in 2017 will actually change. I mean, uh, you, you need to bring about structural changes in the market. You can't do the same thing and then uh, expect a, a, uh, a different uh, result. Uh, the, there's no indication that there will be uh, more... Uh, in improved business confidence, although you know the the changes with respect to the president of the is is a is a cautious uh, something to be cautiously uh, optimistic about. But but you know, can he do something now? That's that's a different question. Um, you need to uh, bring about fundamental changes in labour relations, labour laws to to get pe more people into the labour market. Uh, and and, and, and you know, although there's an improvement in the world economy, that's not transferred and translated into the South African economy. So one thing is what do we expect, and the other question is what is that that we're supposed to do to bring about the required change. But unless we do something else, we will have very much the same uh, result, and job losses will continue in the year that comes. Mr. Bobby? I'm sure it is the wish of every South African that not things starts to improve and that all of the arrows that are currently facing down start to face upwards. And um, it's a terrible circumstance. It's not just about 2017. For, to us as Labour, this uh, dark cloud have been there since before 1994. And uh, our disappointment is that post-1994 things have not changed.
to the better and things are getting worse. Unemployment, as you know, is at record levels. Youth unemployment is at record levels. Uh, we've gone into deep, deep, deep uh, poverty levels. Now 55% of our people are experiencing poverty and that we've become the most unequal society in the whole world. And then there's still an, uh, another monkey in our back called corruption, which is getting no better. We wish that all of that could change in 2018 because we know that without all of those things changing, then uh, South Africa will be in even worse situation than it finds itself already. Now, we obviously things do not change just because we pray or because we wish. Things change when practical steps are taken to address where I agree with Harold, it may be that in the detail we will not agree, that we need to take some practical steps to address the growth path model we inherited from apartheid, to address the structural nature of our unemployment, and, uh, and to address the issue of property, that most black people have no property and therefore cannot be meaningful participants in the economy, we need to address their poverty, the low wage, which means that they, ca they don't have purchasing power to buy goods and therefore to begin to turn the wheels of the economy. And uh, all of those things require bold and they need political leadership that is not compromised by dealings with private sector and, and big business that is hell-bent on addressing those structural natures of the, of, the, of, the, of the economic questions. We need to address, for example, as part of property, the issue of, of land. There's good news coming from the ANC conference about expropriation of land without compensation. We wish that that could be the direction, not in rhetoric, but in practical steps. I was just having a brief uh, conversation just to show you sometimes there's always a gulf between what is being said and what is being done. The ANC government so far have delivered 10 million hectares of, uh, of land to the uh, landless black people. But the most disturbing stat statistics is the one that comes from the Department of Agriculture itself that says of that uh, 10 million hectares uh, distributed, 70 to 80 percent of it is lying fallow, meaning that it's not being used. And uh, so you, you have to address the issue of the, of, the, of the capacity to implement and therefore build the capacity of the state to drive developmental agenda. If all of those things was, was to happen, maybe we will begin to see a knock from the 37.7% unemployment rate or youth unemployment reached 590 uh, last year, second quarter of last year. Those statistics read horror. And I, I guess that South Africa has become so numb that we used to this, uh, to this baggage we are carrying every day. We don't care anymore. There's no demonstrations in the streets. We, we just used to all of this. And, and that's the most worrying part on our side. Now, you mentioned uh, structural change, the both of you. What details in those structural changes would you like to see? Well, <coughs> you see, that's, that's where Mr. Rami and I differ somewhat, maybe. Because everything he's just said, I agree with. Almost everything. Um, you, you know, let's, let's talk about, just before we get to the structural changes, there's a, there's a message that needs to go out in South Africa, and that is that the private sector is welcome in South Africa. You cannot threaten them of... Uh, uh, misappropriate or not, uh, uh, you know, taking away their, 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 their properties, uh, tell them they're the enemy of the state, and then expect them the next moment that they must employ. And then when they employ, make it as hard as possible for them to even dismiss. You see, um, and, and employers don't employ because they want to dismiss. They employ because they need people to work for them. But things happen and mean people need to employ. And, and in terms of structural changes, just on the employment laws, and there's a lot of things that need to happen in the economy, in terms of structures in the economy. But in terms of employment law, the more, the harder you make for a person to dismiss, the more unlikely it is for him to be employed. It is costly to employ. And, and uh, you can't have your, your uh, uh, 
bread uh, buttered on both sides. Um, if you want a job, take the risk of being dismissed. B stay in the job because of integrity, honesty, and hard work. But if a, s a government interferes to such an extent that they prescribe to you so much, interfere so much in the workplace, that it becomes so little attractive to employ, there won't be employment. So that's one of the structural changes that need to happen. And, and there's, there's still no better form of remuneration than a job, even a low-pay job. No grant can pay a person that what, what, what even a low-pay job can pay, pay a person. Am I suggesting the abuse of workers? Not at all. But we see what's happening in the market, marketplace. We also need a totally different attitude of the nation in terms of the will to work and to contribute. We cannot change this world through only through protest action, but I need, in terms of changes that need to happen, I think everybody needs to protest. Everybody needs to protest. But there's, there's structural, legal changes required. Lots of our sectors are governed by bargaining councils where big unions and, and big business dominate those councils and enforce their rules on small business and push small business out of the market. There's structural need, right. changes needed in that Due area. Due to time, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Vavi just to give uh, your view on that and then uh, we wrap it up. That's not structural crisis that the South African so you disagree? Face. I completely disagree. Unless somebody can one day say this clause of the LRA won't allow me as an employer to dismiss a worker who consistently come late to work or who despite my efforts to train him is untrainable, is, is, doesn't have skills, he has an attitude, I can't do anything about these things. If somebody doesn't show us the clauses in the LRA that, uh, that uh, won't allow an employer to act, then uh, sorry, I will not listen to that. Here's the structural crisis facing the South African economy as far as we are concerned. The first one is that the growth path we inherited is a growth path that wholly relies on the mining sector, on the heavy chemicals that is completely domina uh, 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 dominated by the financial sector. If we cannot change that, we're going nowhere in terms of unemployment, poverty, inequalities in the, co in the economy. Thank you very much, that the General Secretary of the South African Federation of Trade Unions, SAFTU, Mr. Zwelin Zimavavi, as well as the National Employers Association of South Africa, NIASA, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Gerard Papenfuss. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Okay. Of course, uh, let's cross over to uh, KZN in Otlanga. We do know that ANC President Sil Ramaphosa says the party's new elective leadership is committed to advancing uh, the interests. But uh, let's go and cross over to the 100 six ANC uh, celebrations and commemorations that are taking place in Durban. Okay, those who are taking pictures, can you do it? Where are they? To turn up? Maybe against the... That background? Yes. To my a photo opportunity. We were supposed to do a tour of the museum. Many people know that there is a museum last uh, for example, there's a school, there's a museum. We're going to cut out that program. Uh, Indeed, uh, these are just the live visuals coming in from Durban. We do know that uh, this is with regards to the ANC's 106th anniversary in honor of our previous party uh, presidents. They include the likes of Josiah Gomede, Pixley Siame, Albert Lutuli, as well as the party's founding president, Langa Dube. We have been crossing throughout uh, the course of the morning there. We've also seen in attendance the ANC's uh, top 
six. One of the questions coming in there is why President Jacob Zuma is not in attendance uh, this morning. We've also seen the likes of Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa and uh, we also heard some of the sentiments and views there coming in from one of the grandchildren to Mr. Langa Dube, of course, the late Langa Dube. He is amongst one of the few veterans that uh, the ANC as well as the members there today are commemorating upon the 106th anniversary down there in Otlanga in Durban in the KZN province. We have been giving you all the visuals and taking you through the proceedings. Of course, this is also towards the run-up of the January 8th statement, which is only going to be taking place on the 13th of January this coming Saturday. Now, we've uh, seen some of those members there. They seem to be making their way up onto uh, the grave site that has been uh, set out for those veterans. We also heard the likes of uh, ANC's Becky Kele today mentioning, of course, course the contributions that these veterans have made uh, to the ANC as well as to where the party is today and of course this also comes on the drops of unity that has been called from uh, King's Velatini, uh, Goodwill's Velatini that is there in KZN. Uh, we've also seen the other family members, grandchildren and uh, wives and other family members make their way there and uh, we have been giving you uh, the live visuals so if you have just tuned in this is the wreath laying ceremony in KZN in Othlange. Indeed uh, joining me in studio is political editor Sophie McQuetta. Very good morning to you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us this morning. Let's just discuss the celebrations as well as the comments uh, from King Will Goodwill, uh, King uh, Goodwill's Velatini with regards to calling for unity at, uh, within the ANC. Well, indeed, today the we can see that the deputy president of the country, who is in this case there in his capacity as the president of the ANC, is laying a wreath there at the grave. We know that the ANC program, as part of the 13th, uh, lead up to the 13th of January, where they will be uh, celebrating 100, more than 100 years of ANC establishment. Uh, he is currently uh, there leading the ANC officials. You know that all of them, they are down there visiting different graves and they will visit the grave of uh, uh, Langalbale Le Dube, they will visit Albert Lituli, they will visit uh, uh, Gumete and they will also visit the family of Peace, Pixley Isaiah Gaseme with the aim of uh, perhaps looking back at the history of the organization since it was established and perhaps the reason why the party was established or the organization was established also perhaps revoking the memories and uh, the principle of those who led the ANC since 1912 and perhaps looking back at ensuring that perhaps they can learn some lessons in terms of the different type of leadership that was presented at different types of uh, uh, challenging times. You know that uh, currently Ramaphosa is trying very hard to ensure that ANC is fighting for uh, survival in terms of uh, doing better in the coming elections in, in 2019 and therefore the issue of unity is very important. Yesterday indeed they visited the king yesterday who also advised them to put aside their differences and work as a collective but also try and unite the ANC membership but also because you know that uh, KwaZulu Natal is a very critical province, it's the biggest province of the ANC but also lots of violence there and therefore it is uh, uh, his uh, nation that is suffering when there are these kinds of conflict in that province and therefore of course the main issue is unity and you can see that uh, we have Sihlesi Galala there, the, the chairperson uh, whose position is in question because of the court challenge and also uh, Senzo Mkunu there, the former secretary general who is currently the NEC member, Paul Mashatile, the new treasurer general, uh, we have uh, uh, Malusi Kikaba there, the, the, the finance minister who is also a member of the new NEC. You have the regional leadership, you can see the mayor there. And uh, it looks like they are presi presenting a united force. Now with that being said, and speaking on the issues of factionalism and moving towards unity, uh, Nkosa Zanat Lamini Zuma is also said to be in attendance. Let's highlight that fact that she is there on the calls for unity. Well, Dr Nkosa Zanat Lamini Zuma is an ANC veteran. And I would expect her to do exactly that. You'd recall in 2007, 
he contested uh, deputy president position, uh, 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 challenging Halima Mutlanti, who also contested the same position. And after she lost, she went to the podium with all those who were participating in different positions to go and, uh, uh, you know, congratulate them. So for me, it's, it's, it's not surprising. And that's what she is expected to do as the senior ANC member. In fact, she is supposed to demobilize her troops, those who were behind her, lobbying for her, pushing for her to say, now the leadership is in place, now we have to rally behind the leadership, because that's the ANC's position. Once the leader has been elected or the leadership is elected, you rally behind the leader, and therefore she must lead by example. She must actually communicate with all those who supported her to say, now it is the ANC that is in charge, there is a new leadership, we take directives from the new leadership, and she must lead by example she cannot allow a situation where his name is dragged in terms of ensuring that there's divisions or people continuing. They can't continue. She has to demobilize her troops. Why is Jacob Zuma not in, in attendance this morning? Well, uh, I think uh, he wants to give the current leadership space to start with work. But I expect him to be in East London uh, if there are no divisions. And I think this time around, contrary to Polokwan, after his victory, Ramaphosa reached out to the uh, uh, outgoing president or the former president. He indicated that uh, they still value his contribution. And I think the way Ramaphosa handled the transition immediately after the conference, it has made it easy for perhaps a person like President Jacob Zuma to go and attend any ANC gathering, contrary to what happened in Pulukwani. After Pulukwani, there was a fallout because the way the whole transition was handled and statements after Mbeki lost to Zuma in Pulukwani, it created an animosity. We saw the breakaway of COPE. And I think Ramaphosa doesn't want to repeat the same mistakes you know, the Polokwane mistake. The same with uh, Bloemfontein. Even though uh, Khalima Montlanti is still trying to be part of the collective, but at times it is very, very difficult for him. What do you think are the underlying challenges that the ANC still has with regards to the factionalism? Well, I think it's up to the current leadership to ensure that uh, they deal with those challenges and they, they kind of... Uh, uh, f uh, ensure that there's unity. It is up to the current leadership. They have to do just that. What can we expect uh, on uh, Saturday? Well, of course, on Saturday, it's a big day. Uh, the, this will be a first uh, statement that will be delivered by the new president, Cyril Ramaphosa. And I think the theme, again, will revolve around issue of unity and how the ANC hopes to turn the tide in terms of ensuring that, again, South Africans believe in the party. Indeed. Thank you very much for joining us here in studio. Of course, political editor at SABC News, uh, Sophie Mokwena, just unpacking a little bit of the 106th ANC celebrations taking place in Durban. For now, though, let's take a short break. Do stay tuned to Newsroom. Africans are increasingly using digital platforms for life, work and play. Information is key for us. We live in, a, in an information age. We live in the digital age. I'm mostly on WhatsApp because not all my friends have iPhones so, so they don't have FaceTime. On Network, we tell you about Africa's technology and social media landscape. And some here are using the internet to raise political concerns. Some of the exposés on political issues come from um, what you call your diasporic online media. Africans are also using technology to create. For African technology and social media news, join me, Pumela Lezondi, on Network every Sunday at 9 p.m. With the, um, the stories of abuse from the other eight, um, but they haven't been ready to, to pursue any angles. They, they've, they've offered their support. Uh, they've offered the comfort to the, to, to the eight, and it's been an amazing journey. It feels like your heart actually literally 
sunk in your shoes. It wasn't a long encounter. Um, uh, I think at the time I, I froze. The way the criminal justice system deals with sexual violence is problematic. And I don't know, unless there's a fundamental change in many things, the way prosecutors deal with uh, the victim in the matter. For all investigative insights, stay tuned to special assignment every Saturday at 17.30. ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa says the party's newly elected leadership is committed to advancing the interests of people through the economy. Well, several universities finally agreed to admit walk-ins after engaging with EFF students' organisations at the weekend. The identification process of the bodies of victims of a train crash between Kronstadt and Hennemann is expected to resume today. And in your sports, the Proteas resume play at the crease after rain prevented play yesterday on day three of the first cricket test between the Proteas and India at Newlands in Cape Town. Lopetain Celtic moved two places on the log to six after a 2-1 win against Golden Arrows. Having a look at your lead story this hour, ANC President Sil Ramaphosa says the party's newly elected leadership is committed to advancing the interests of the people through the economy. Well, he was speaking at tribute events in Inanda in Natal on the ANC's 106th anniversary in honour of previous party presidents. They include Josiah Gomede, Pixley Seme, Albert Lutuli and the party's founding president, Langa Dube. Well, staying with the ANC 106 anniversary celebrations, newly elected ANC Secretary General Ace Magoshule says that the ANC leadership that has been elected will work together. Magoshule says 2018 is the year that unity should prevail in the ANC. This is the year where we are going to make sure that we are united. We are going to work together uh, as different, uh, when they were before conference, there were different groupings. And I know it's the mood of conference. Always after conference, we accept the leadership which has been installed uh, or elected. And we move on. That's how the ANC works. That's the character of the African National Congress. Uh, the branches have spoken and we need to move forward. In my link, I spoke about you and the other top leaders of the ANC being here to honor your founding fathers. But what you also did yesterday is visit uh, Isilo, who King Goodwill Zolitin. Apparently, he called all the feuding parties together and said, let's hold hands and start afresh. How did that go? Well, it went well, uh, and uh, because of the history of the ANC, you must remember our kings, uh, our traditional leadership played a role uh, during the establishment, uh, the foundation of the ANC, uh, even in the eight, 1846. Uh, uh, some of the leaders, uh, particularly Utinizul, and many others, when the ANC was established uh, in 1912 in, in Bloemfontein, the kings, uh, the traditional leadership played a very important role, and that's why we fought, let's start here and move to Eastern Cape and we'll be moving throughout the country. Uh, and the king said to us, uh, remember, this is the movement, not only of the ANC members, it's the movement of the people of South Africa as well as the continent. Well, earlier, SABC News spoke to the party's national spokesperson, Cusela Dico, about the preparations for today's big celebration. She was at the Otlanga Institute in Inanda on the KZN North Coast. 
this is an annual celebration. I think we've over the years built the capacity to be able to do it. Uh, but it's special because the 54th National Conference would have laid the ground for this that we're doing now in terms of the celebrations. You're seeing an ANC that is much stronger, an ANC that is more united, an ANC that really has focus in terms of the program that we're going to be running this year. So the January 8th statement that you speak about on the 13th of January uh, that the President, Comrade Sarah Ramaphosa, will deliver will really unpack, report back on conference, unpack the program for the year, but obviously within the broader outlook of the five-year resolutions that we took at conference. So we're starting here uh, today uh, as part of the celebrations. As you're saying, we're standing on hallowed ground. We've come back to the founding fathers of the African National Congress, you know, to reconnect with our communities, report back on what we did at conference. We're going to be laying wreaths. The president will lay a wreath uh, for uh, former president Langalibale Ledube here. Right here. Right here. The deputy president will be in Moses Mabida. Uh, Comrade Didi Mabuza, he will lay a wreath at the resting place of uh, President Josiah Gumede, and then we'll then converge later on uh, at the resting place of former President uh, Chief Albert Lutul. So really just connecting, going back, uh, you, sorry, and we started with uh, former President Oliver Tambo in Johannesburg. So we're building up, hoping to visit all of our presidents during the course of the year, and then go down to East London for the cake cutting ceremony this afternoon. Yeah. So it's going to be a really eventful day, but we've made sure that it's got the necessary content to celebrate 106 years of self-struggle. The organization needs to have a stance, and it's really commendable that everyone is talking about this unity. But there are reports of disunity, and especially in this province that we're in, people who are apparently disgruntled uh, at the new leadership and are not convinced um, that this is the leadership to follow. How do we say to our viewers mm. out there, mm. you hear this, but this is what the mm. ANC is saying? Well, the reality of the matter is that you had branches of the ANC representing our almost million members who came to conference and they absolutely rejected disunity. They rejected factionalism. They did not elect a leadership that came from one so-called slate, but they chose a unity leadership. And I think that sends a very strong message to say that as branches of the ANC, as society in general, South Africans do not want to see a divided ANC. And ours is to ensure that that leadership begins to work together as a collective yeah. in order for the prosperity of the nation. Well, indeed, Kusela Diko, the ANC's national spokesperson, of course, she was talking to SABC News earlier. Uh, President Jacob Zuma's announcement last month that government will subsidize free higher education for poor and working class undergraduate students in their first year of study at public universities has led to a great deal of confusion. Well, this week's tertiary institutions are bracing themselves ahead of the reopening of the 2018 academic year. Earlier, we spoke to Deputy Minister of Higher Education and Training, Buti Manamela, about the readiness of the tertiary institution for fee-free education. I think, firstly, the, um, is at least with regards to um, students who are supposed to be beneficiaries of fee-free higher education, there's no confusion. Uh, we are meeting with the uh, university vice chancellors, the principals of Tibet colleges, students' organizations, uh, and various other sectors uh, today throughout into the week uh, to understand why, uh, what could be the uh, challenges that they're confronted with. But essentially, what the president announced was that over the next five years, we will be facing in fee-free higher education at post-school uh, uh, education and training institutions, meaning universities and Tibet colleges. So for the first time entrants who qualify, whose parents' joint income does not exceed 350,000 rands, they qualify for fee-free higher education. Is that of 2018? That's 2018. Okay. So if you've made an application to a university, you've been granted a space, you've made an application to the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, they will make an assessment of whether you do qualify for this, and then they will give you a buzzer. And for those students who are doing their second, third, and fourth year, those students, their uh, uh, loan will then be turned into a grant. Uh, and thirdly, all of these students will obviously have to enter into some academic uh, performance commitment and post uh, uh, you know, uh, post uh, school commitment, be it community service or anything of the sort. So it's not essentially free uh, in that uh, students will not pay fees, but there should be commitment 
that, I mean, a, a commitments on their part in terms of what is it that they're going to do after they get qualified for the country. Okay, now the presidency also reported that it's not only, only going to be covering um, tuition, it's also going to be subsidizing transport costs and accommodation costs. Uh, where essentially uh, <coughs> are they going to be getting the money from this? Well, Treasurer will be making an announcement. The Minister of Finance, as part of his budgetary statement, will make an announcement in terms of the allocation with regards to this. Are universities ready to handle this? Registrations are taking place this week and lectures yes. are, st are set to start in the next couple of days. Yes, universities are ready to handle this. Um, there is, I think, the, the idea that this is spectacularly new is actually very ridiculous. Uh, universities have been doing this for the last three to four years since uh, there was a parent, I think, who collapsed at the University of Johannesburg about three to four years uh, ago. Universities introduced uh, 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 online registration, which has been working perfectly well through uh, uh, the department's Apply Now program and career guidance uh, program, uh, CETA. We have reached out to uh, you know students and to say to them this is what we expect from you in terms of uh, you know making application and lastly uh, you know covering uh, uh, tuition transport and accommodation has been happening at Tivet colleges and NASFAS has been covering all of those uh, you know for students uh, you know between I mean who are uh, uh, whose parents and between uh, zero and hundred and twenty five thousand what is new is that this is now extended to those whose parents and uh, jointly to 350,000 rents. And what I must emphasize, which is quite critical, is that more than 90% of household will be covered by this pronouncement by the president. And I think with what is also more critical is the fact that it does not necessarily address the available spaces. So we're not all of a sudden going to have new spaces available. It is still on the basis of existing spaces at universities. The question of the expansion of the post-school sector is part of government's long-term strategy, which is dealt with separately from what the president announced last year. Now let's have a look at the issue of walk-ins <coughs> and the capacity. We do not want to see a repeat of that UJ situation that happened three years ago. What is your stance on that? Well, it's not my stance. The um, uh, we are requesting parents and students who have not applied last year uh, but who since receiving their metric results feel strongly that they need to go and further their studies to use the department's central application uh, 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 clearing system which uh, in essence will then allocate them to available spaces in all the universities. We strongly discourage uh, the walk-ins. Walk we discourage parents and students to go physically to universities. I'm aware that there are four universities as we speak where there are long queues um, and those universities have in any way prepared themselves for those. They've got personnel who are assisting those who are on the queues. But we dis strongly discourage this and more so that it will mainly be those students who are on our uh, catch system who will be given preference because it is much easier for us to allocate those students to available spots. Let us use a system which has been trusted, which has been used for the last few years, and which we believe has been able to allocate students well, into available spots. Well, we do know spots. that uh, higher education is meeting with tertiary institutions today. What are we expecting to be the details and the outcome of this meeting? Well, nothing spectacular other than, you know, us getting a sense from University of Chancellors if the e, uh, so it's essentially a troubleshooting meeting, if, if, if I may put it that way. It's day one. Uh, the president has made the announcement. How effectively is it being implemented? Are there areas which we need to be concerned about? And as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, on day one, there has essentially not been, uh, you know, major causes for concern. We'll, uh, we'll be monitoring the situation over the next week or two to see how smooth the process is. But we believe that at the time when learning and teaching should uh, uh, commence at universities and at Tibet colleges, that it will. This impending chaos that many people are talking about, we do not really anticipate it. 
Well, that was uh, myself speaking to Buti Malamela just earlier on with regards to uh, that announcement from President Jacob Zuma regarding free higher education and its rollout system. Moving on, the family of one of six young girls who went missing in 1988 and 1989 has asked for answers and better feedback from police. Well, this follows an investigation by the Current Affairs show Focus that found that a letter written almost 30 years ago and attributed to Anne-Marie Vapana would be a fake. The disappearance of Anne-Marie and her friend Odette was linked to a pedophile, Gert van Rooyen, and his girlfriend, Joey Harov. Annemarie Wapenaar and Odette Boucher disappeared together in September 1989 in Kempton Park while on the way to swim. Five months after Van Rooyen and Harov's deaths, a letter was found at the Fabric Library in Midrand. In the note, she asked for help and declared that she and her friend Odette had been kidnapped. This giving hope to the families of the two girls that they could still be alive. But Annemarie's and Odette's names were misspelt. The letter was also written in English, although the girls were Afrikaans speaking. A forensic handwriting expert has compared the note to two other letters written by Anna-Marie before disappearance and found inconsistencies. There are other elements of handwriting which I concentrated on when I looked at this, which are unconscious. Um, things like space, for example, and movement, those are not things that are easy to, to emulate. You will always go back to your way of doing it. So I'd say very probable, not written by the same person. Very probable, highly probable. Anna-Marie's mother, Kubi Varpenar, and her brother, Herman, now have their doubts. They question the authenticity of the letter. Kubi Varpenar says her daughter would not have misspelled her own name and her command of the English language was not of the level used in the note. Now they want answers and better feedback from the police and Anna-Marie's 85-year-old mother hopes one day she'll find closure. Alette von Rensburg, Wright, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, the weather in the country presented a contrast over the weekend with parts of the Western Cape receiving much-needed rain from the inland provinces, sweltering in a heat wave. Well, cricket fans were disappointed when the third day of the first test between the Proteas and India was completely washed out. It's the first time this has happened at Cape Town's Newland Ground for 82 years, but all welcomed the steady day's rainfall in the drought-stricken city. Much more rain, however, is needed to alleviate Cape Town's water shortage. The country's interior can expect more scorching weather today, with temperatures expected to be in the mid-30s in Gauteng and even higher elsewhere. Imran Tahir produced a superb performance with the ball. The Proteus leg spinner put his side in the driving seat, scalping three wickets for just 18 runs. Gifton Gope is flying toward third and he is there with a trip, trip, triple. His first in the big leagues. It is a Ferrari front row lockout. Unless Hamilton can get on pole and he can't. Ferrari for the first time since France in 2008 have locked out the front. For all your sports news, keep it locked to Sports Live every Saturday and Sunday from 2030. Welcome back. For the better part of 2017, the labour and employer sector and the economy has been dominated by job losses, 
retrenchment and low growth. The depressed labour market shed over a million jobs, mainly in the mining sector. The business environment has also been subdued by low economic growth, decline in business confidence and a lack of clear policy direction. To discuss the 2018 prospects for labour and business environment, we were joined in studio by uh, General Secretary of uh, South African Federation of Trade Union, uh, Zweli Zimavavi, and the National Employers Association of South Africa, NYASA, Chief Executive Officer, Harald Papenfuss. There's nothing to suggest that uh, the trend that we saw in, 2000, uh, in, in, in 2017 will actually change. I mean, uh, you, you need to bring about structural changes in the market. You can't do the same thing and then uh, expect a, a, uh, a different uh, result. Uh, the, there's no indication that there will be uh, more uh, in, improved business confidence, although, you know, the, the changes with respect to the President of the Republic is, is, uh, is a cautious, uh, something to be cautiously uh, optimistic about, but, but, you know, can he do something now? That's, that's a different question. Um, you need to uh, bring about fundamental changes in labor relations, labor laws, to, to get pe more people into the labor market. And, uh, and, and, and you know, although there's an improvement in the world economy, that's not transferred and translated into the South African economy. So one thing is what do we expect, and the other question is what is that that we're supposed to do to bring about the required change. But unless we do something else, we will have very much the same uh, result and job losses will continue in the year that comes. Mr. Bobby? I'm sure it is the wish of every South African that, that things start to improve and that all of the arrows that are currently facing down start to face upwards. And um, it's a terrible circumstance. It's not just about 2017. For, to us as Labour, this uh, dark cloud have been there since before 1994. And uh, our disappointment is that post-1994, things have not changed to the better and things are getting worse. Unemployment, as you know, is at record levels. Youth unemployment is at record levels. Uh, we've gone into deep, deep, deep uh, poverty levels. Now 55% of our people are experiencing poverty and that we've become the most unequal society in the whole world. And then there's still an, uh, another monkey in our back called corruption, which is getting no better. We wish that all of that could change in 2018, because we know that without all of those things changing, then uh, South Africa will be in even worse situation than it finds itself already. Now, we obviously things do not change just because we pray or because we wish things change when practical steps are taken to address where I agree with Harold, it may be that in the detail we will not agree, that we need to take some practical steps to address the growth path model we inherited from apartheid, to address the structural nature of our unemployment, and, uh, and to address the issue of property that most black people have no property and therefore cannot be meaningful participants in the economy. We need to address their poverty, the low wage, which means that they, ca they don't have purchasing power to buy goods and therefore to begin to turn the wheels of the economy. And uh, all of those things require bold and they need political leadership that is not compromised by dealings with private sector and, and big business. That is help and on addressing those structural natures of the of the of the of the economic questions we need to address for example as part of property the issue of of land there's good news coming from the ANC conference about expropriation of land without compensation we wish that that could be the direction not in rhetoric but in practical steps i was just having a brief uh, conversation just to show you sometimes there's always a gulf between what is being said and what is being done. The ANC government so far have delivered 10 million hectares of, uh, of land to the uh, landless black people. But the most disturbing stat statistics is the one that comes from the Department of Agriculture itself that says of that uh, 10 million hectares uh, distributed, 
70 to 80 percent of it is lying fallow, meaning that it's not being used. And uh, so you, you have to address the issue of the, of the, of the capacity to implement and therefore build the capacity of the state to drive developmental agenda. If all of those things was, was to happen, maybe we will begin to see a knock from the 37.7% unemployment rate or youth unemployment reached 55.90 uh, last year, second quarter of last year. Those statistics read horror. And I, I guess that South Africa has become so numb that we used to this, uh, to this baggage we are carrying every day. We don't care anymore. There's no demonstrations in the streets. We, we just used to all of this. And, and that's the most worrying part on our side. Now, you mentioned uh, structural change, the both of you. What details in those structural changes would you like to see? Well, <coughs> you see, that's, that's where Mr. Rami and I differ somewhat, maybe. Because everything he's just said, I agree with. Almost everything. Um, you, you know, let's, let's talk about, just before we get to the structural changes, there's a, there's a message that needs to go out in South Africa, and that is that the private sector is welcome in South Africa. You cannot threaten them of uh, uh, misappropriate, or not, uh, uh, you know, taking away their, 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 their properties, uh, tell them they're the enemy of the state, and then expect them the next moment that they must employ. And then when they employ, make it as hard as possible for them to even dismiss. You see, um, and, and employees don't employ because they want to dismiss. They employ because they need people to work for them. But things happen and mean people need to employ. And, and in terms of structural changes, just on the employment laws, and there's a lot of things that need to happen in the economy, in terms of structures in the economy. But in terms of employment law, the more, the harder you make for a person to dismiss, the more unlikely it is for him to be employed. It is costly to employ. And, and uh, this, you can't have your, your uh, uh, bread uh, buttered on both sides. Um, if you want a job, take the risk of being dismissed. B stay in the job because of integrity, honesty, and hard work. But if a, s a government interferes to such an extent that they prescribe to you so much, interfere so much in the workplace, that it becomes so little attractive to employ, there won't be employment. So that's one of the structural changes that need to happen. And, and there's, there's still no better form of remuneration than a job, even a low-pay job. No grant can pay a person that what, what, what even a low-pay job can pay, pay a person. Am I suggesting the abuse of workers? Not at all. But we see what's happening in the market. Marketplace. We also need a totally different attitude of the nation in terms of the will to work and to contribute. We cannot change this world through only through protest action, but I need, in terms of changes that need to happen, I think everybody needs to protest. Everybody needs to protest. But there's, there's structural, legal changes required. Lots of our sectors are governed by bargaining councils where big unions and, and big business dominate those councils and enforce their rules on small business and push small business out of the market. There are structural need, right. changes needed in that Due area. Due to time, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Vavi just to give uh, your view on that and then uh, we wrap it up. That's not structural crisis that uh, South Africa. So you disagree? Face. I completely disagree. Unless somebody can one day say this clause of the LRA won't allow me as an employer to dismiss a worker who consistently come late to work or who despite my efforts to train him is untrainable, is, is, doesn't have skills, he has an attitude, I can't do anything about these things. If somebody doesn't show us the clauses in the LRA that, uh, that uh, won't allow an employer to act, then uh, sorry, I will not listen to that. Here's the structural crisis facing the South African economy as far as we are concerned. The first one is that the growth path we inherited is a growth path that wholly relies on the mining sector, on the heavy chemicals that is completely dominate, uh, 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 dominated by the financial sector. If we cannot change that, we're going nowhere in terms of unemployment, poverty, inequalities in the, in the economy.
when I was passing the casino, I said, that edge came, you know, I said, I'll just try, you never know. You might go home with 80,000, you know, times four the amount that you have. And that stupid day, I lost all my money. Never allow glamorous lifestyles to push you beyond your means. The awakening moment was the 2007, when I left my children alone. I realized this is, this is hurting me. Ask for professional help if gambling is controlling you. Know when to stop. I faced reality that, you know what, for you there's no quick reach. You know, so you, you just have to work hard. So it's, it's gone. For all your uplifting stories, catch Bupilong every Friday at 17.30. Welcome back. Well, rain prevented play on day three of the first cricket test between the Proteas and India at Newlands in Cape Town. The end of day two, South Africa was 65 for two with a lead of 142. As it stands, of course, it's 94 for six and they are leading by 171 runs. Let's cross over now live to Newlands. Improved, has he? From the first, he wasn't at his best, but he's bowled with some good control. Started this morning to the left hander, Kahisa Rabada, and since then he's just continued on his merry way. He's found a much better length and been a lot more consistent. Yeah, it's definitely a lot more energy in this uh, innings, and particularly today. He's running well, he's got good rhythm, he's bowling at sharp speeds, getting the ball to deviate just that little bit. gone up there's another for India and they'll check it and they'll go upstairs but they've been right on top India here and it's that man Shami again well, the decision's uh, gone up uh, to the uh, TV umpire the ball's nipped back in I as far as uh, delivery is concerned it's a legal delivery well behind the popping crease question is did he get a nick or did it strike him outside the off stump it's hit him on the knee roll probably crashing onto the stump so even if it's brushing the stumps it's the umpire's call all I can save him is an edge hey there's no edge there daylight between bass and ball and that is going into the stumps Right on target. The review will be lost. Importantly, the wicket is lost by South Africa. Vernon Philander have gone without scoring. It's 95 for seven.
announcement just coming out live of that uh, South Africa versus India test. Just seeing that uh, wicket gone there at uh, 95 for 7. Moving on, Australia ruthlessly extinguished England's resistance to claim an innings victory in the fifth Ashes test and complete a 4-0 series route on the final day in Sydney. While well, uh, the tourists with skipper Joe Root, weakened by a stomach bug and unable to continue batting, dissolved after lunch, losing their last four wickets for their fourth comprehensive defeat of the series. Christ the point. Pat Cubans led by uh, the Australian offensive in uh, Sydney with four wickets for 39 to finish man of the match and the leading wicket taker in the series with 23. England finished at 180 for nine off of 88.1 overs as Australia won by an innings and 123 runs. It followed comprehensive losses on the troubled five-test tour in Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. The fourth test was drawn in Melbourne. Stricken Root did not come out to bat after lunch as he continued to experience discomfort after his overnight stomach bug. Some football news now. Bloemfontein Celtic moved from number eight up to the sixth position on the APSA Premier Log after beating Golden Arrows 2-1, while Tippy United are slowly climbing the ladder after a two-goal victory of their own. Despite a number of first-half chances, the deadlock was broken seven minutes after the restart when Linda Mtambo netted with a thunderous long-range effort to make it 1-0 to the away side. It was soon 2-0 to Chip United when Dumbo, who was making his debut for the visitors, netted his second in the 63rd minute. Meanwhile, the first half goals from Victor Litzbola as well as uh, Dean Hotto saw Bloemfontein Celtic beat Golden Arrows 2-1 at the Dr. Molamela Stadium. The Durban Bay side made their second half pressure till in the 68th minute when Thomas Chideu pulled a goal back, but Celtic managed to soak up the rest of the pressure to secure the win. The goals through Sami Siabi, Walter Musona as well as Rodney Ramachalela ensured Olaguane City came back to stun Mamalodi Sundowns as they won 3-2 in the Apps of Premiership. Cape Town City are second and a point behind Downs. Indeed, that is where we wrap up the newsroom. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let's have a look at your weather forecast up next. Welcome to one of your favorite weekly review analysis programs, Media Monitor. So let's look at the race itself. It's just becoming a personality contest where people just want somebody to guard their own vested interest. And I feel that the country is at a point now where we need some sort of change. It is ANC policy that they will have to implement. We fairly know the direction the ANC wants to take. As a leader, you have to implement. So what was it like on the ground in Kenya? Well, the country is divided. It, the country is very divided. I think within the country for me, the one person that I criticize severely and I'm not very happy with his approach is Raila Odinga with him pulling out. Stay tuned to Media Monitor and catch on analysts unpacking top stories every Sunday from 9 a.m. A very good day and welcome to the weather desk. Well, we've been talking of heat waves and a lot is happening in the weather. Let's start by taking a look at the clear skies. Here from, uh, Vin, uh, from Namibia into Botswana, Zimbabwe, expecting clear skies today. And most of uh, uh, the, the Sahara Desert expecting clear skies. What you're seeing here is just cirrus cloud, high level clouds, not really causing anything in terms of precipitation. And when you look at your precipitation, you're expecting isolated to scattered showers here over the eastern parts of the country today, including Gozul Nata, where we're seeing scattered showers uh, for the rest of the day, but it, it is expected to start much later on in the day, and of course some severe thunderstorms over the interior. Looking at Madagascar, we're expecting the load just moving down to our southern parts. Heavier rains expected in the southern parts of Madagascar there as well, while some isolated showers expected in places from northern Mozambique 
into Zambia, into northern Angola there as well. And when you look at uh, this is what your precipitation will look like tomorrow, we're still having some rains here along the eastern coastline and of course over the eastern part of southern Africa, including Bumalanga, uh, Limpopo, and of course Gauteng province for tomorrow, isolated showers. Taking a look at your maximum temperatures today, Uppington is at 33. While it is uh, cooler in Sutherland at 23 and Cape Town at 22, it stays cool along the southern coastline, PE at 24. But as we move towards the east and interior, we're seeing hotter temperatures, highs of 37 in Pretoria, 35 in Bolokwan. And for the north, we're still seeing those extremely hot temperatures in places like uh, Bait Bridge, we're seeing a high of 46, 39 if you're in Khaburuni, but uh, this uh, is expected much later on in the day. There's isolated showers for most of the day, we're expecting clear skies for the whole of Botswana. Now quickly moving towards Madagascar, scattered showers in the south, isolated in the north, warmer temperatures in the north at a high of 28, while back towards the Central African Republic, we're expecting uh, less rainfall, but uh, temperatures peaking at uh, 33, and to in, in places like Kilimanjaro, 27 in Nairobi, and Mombasa, peaking at uh, 32. That's all I have for you for now, but uh, stay tuned to SABC News. Indeed, thank you very much. As he said, that brings a wrap up of a newsroom this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Until tomorrow at 9 a.m. Bye bye. A very good morning to you, and thank you so much indeed for choosing Morning Life. But I want to know yeah. the basic thing. Chris Alder Lewis, SABC News in Parktown, Johannesburg. Zimbabwe.